Can't do it alone, you know. It takes a mob of guys like you and enough money to make them look good. Well, I know plenty of guys. It's not like playing winos in the street. You can't outrun them. I never Lonnie. played for no winos. You gotta keep his con even after you take his money. He can't know you took him. You're scared of him. Right down to my socks, Buster. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host uh, and voiceover artist in San Diego, California, and excited to be walking back into the world of Redford and Newman, or Newman and Redford, depending on what you prefer, uh, as we uh, tackle this uh, fantastically interesting movie here, Steve uh the sting well i i i really am excited that we're sort of challenging ourselves in a new way doing mm. our two donald sutherland movies back to back and now we're doing multiple redford newman and plus the great director george roy hill back to back and then mm. we're going to continue discussing one of newman's great films in the 80s with uh the verdict and yeah. one of our early films from the cinephiles that we've been wanting to redo forever with robert redford which is the natural and yeah. i really like that we're just kind of digging deep into this world for yeah. a little while it's fun well yeah because we've got two fantastic artists who've created some incredible work along with the other directors uh who've been part of making these films and so it's fun to kind of take us we we we, we always drive in the car but it's always fun to stop and take an exit walk around check out the walnuts or <laughs> the strawberries uh you know when you're taking a long trip and i think in a way this is what we're doing now with this uh this particular run we've been on lately so i like it um, and of course, we also have, just as we had in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, we have questions from our patrons. Yeah. And of course, Patreon is one of the best ways to support the cinephiles. You can get ad free versions of the show, access to our cinephile shorts, which, spoiler alert, we just recorded one, an <laughs> impromptu one, mere moments ago, talking about screens and the way the world has changed in the last 30 or 40 years. And we also have our advisory board, which has helped us come up with this new schedule and you can access both ad free versions of the show and our cinephile shorts through Apple podcasts, just a one click subscription right there. Yeah. And also to the people who listen to our commercials, you know, um, they pop up on the show all the time. If any of those products really appeal to you, please use our codes that we talk about there on every one of those, uh, 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 sponsor commercials that we do. Sponsorships are so important for us to keep on doing the show so for those of you who want to find a new way to support us uh, and, and those products work for you, please make sure you sign up and use our code so that those sponsors keep coming back to support us here on the cinephiles like Fiji Water recently, Roundhouse Provisions. So many fantastic uh, sponsors have come aboard to say they appreciate the work we do, appreciate our audience, and want to offer a product that you all might enjoy using. So please make sure to explore that if it appeals to you. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all of that support. And definitely thank you for clicking on those sponsors. Um, the sting, John, I gotta say, <laughs> even before we start, it's so yeah. funny. Like I love Butch Cassidy and Sundance kid. Mm. Obviously, you know, we both have deep love for that film. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it until we got into it, but man, this is such an influential film. You know, we talk about the influence the film has over time. It's like, well, this yeah. movie is so influential on me personally mm. because i've written two con artist movies oh essentially yes. okay and yeah. so like and it's really formative so as we go through this movie there's some things where it's like here's how this inspired me or really here is what i stole from this thing yeah you know and there's a lot of that but let me ask you a question we always start with which yeah. and i believe i know the answer to this how did you first come to this film um i think i saw it a few years ago for the first time on tcm no, or maybe no. At, I can tell you how oh, you when? saw it at my house. Oh, really? Yeah, you had not seen it, and Karen and I—it's one of Karen's favorites—and we invited you oh. over and cooked you dinner and showed you ah, the Sting ah. maybe ten years ago. Well, there you go. It yeah. does feel like it was ten years ago. So there's the answer. All right. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me answer your question. You and Karen, <laughs> if you forgot, made me a wonderful meal, and I was able to enjoy the movie with you all because I hadn't seen it up until that point for whatever reasons you know and so yeah. it, it 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 was nice to be able to watch maybe an early cinephiles episode <laughs> that was never recorded our conversations during and after the movie yeah. it was the prehistory of the cinephiles yes exactly um for me this is exactly like butch butch and sundance i have no idea 
when I saw this the first time. I certainly know I didn't see the beginning for a long time, mm. you know, and it was one that I can't, but it was definitely one like Butch Casting the Sundance Kid, like The Shining, like yeah. so many other movies where as I'm switching channels, if the sting was on, I'm in and I'd watch the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. A bit of pre-production. So the, this is written by David S. Ward and who was a young screenwriter and he was sort of interested in pickpockets and I'm not exactly sure why he started researching pickpockets, right. but researching pickpockets led him to a book called the big con, the story of confidence by David Maurer. It's a 1940s book wow. and it's follows the real life confidence men, brothers, Fred and Charlie Gondorf. Yeah. Oh, and so a lot of this is, the ideas in it and the cons in it are where the movie comes from. And Ward is reading this and going, why hasn't anyone made a movie about this? Right. So he sits down, takes him a long time to write the screenplay over a year for reasons that we'll get into as we go along. Mm -hmm. He sends it off to a bunch. He's not represented by an agent or anybody. And it goes in what's called the slush pile. And the slush pile is a, is a box of scripts that agents have and that studios have and executives have. And it's basically all the crap that comes in and they force their assistants to read them, which of <laughs> course is the plot of the assistants is about a slush pile and assistants reading it, which is the, one of the first connections. And this young assistant reads this script and writes the coverage mm -hmm. that says this could be a great American screenplay and a award winning major cast, major director film. Wow. And he hands this to his boss, who is Mike Metafoy, who will hmm. soon be a studio head, yeah. but at this moment is basically a big, powerful agent. And he says to his young assistant, Okay, I will try to sell this, but if it doesn't sell, you're fired. Wow. Classic, <laughs> classic Hollywood <laughs> asshole agent guy <laughs> to his assistant. He sold it to Universal Studios that afternoon, Ooh, the wow. same afternoon he got the coverage. Huh. This young assistant took that coverage, framed it, and has it on his wall to hit this day. And that assistant, I feel like I'm doing the rest of the story. <laughs> and that assistant <laughs> is Rob Cohen, director oh. of Dragon the Bruce Lee story and Dragonheart, mm. Daylight, Fast and the Furious. That was his, his first claim to fame is he's the guy who pulled the sting out of the slush pile. Wow. Yeah. Back then. Isn't That's that crazy? Amazing. That is crazy. Yeah. That is amazing. So and initially, it was going to be a bunch of young people making this movie. And initially, they were going to have David S. Ward, the screenwriter, directed, who was yeah. a first-time director, right. wanted to be a director. Later on, directs another movie we've done on The Cinephiles, which is he did Major League yeah. 20 years later. Too high. Uh, Too high. Yeah. <laughs> but so he was going to direct it with a bunch of young actors. And one of the directors that they went after is... Jack Nicholson mm, to directed. play the Robert Redford role. Oh, interesting. Okay. And he read the script. And basically what he said was he was 100% sure that this movie would be a hit, but he was more interested in doing Chinatown and the last detail. Hey, and so he turned it down. Can't deny that. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense. Yeah. And this brings us to our very first question, which comes from patron Adam McAllister, who asks, mm. Um, Jack Nicholson turned down the role of hooker. Would this film still have worked with Paul and Jack as the leads? I may be one of the only people that thinks it still have good, could have been an all timer. I think, no, I think Jack Nicholson in the Paul Newman role would have worked, but not Jack Nicholson in the Robert Redford role. There's a, I don't know. There's a sympathy you feel with, with Robert Redford in the film, the frustration and the anger I never felt that way with any of the films with Jack. Yeah, you know, like like even when he's trying to get vengeance, even when he's supposed to be the good guy, Jack always has that devilish smile or that impish little smile of his that he can never take away from his performances. Until about until about Schmidt. That was like the first mm. time I'd seen that there was another Jack Nicholson in there that really could deliver a a, a, a performance full of pathos, you know? And so uh I I don't think it would have worked quite as well. Um, with Paul Newman and Jack Nicholson necessarily. So to me, one of the pieces of magic of this movie mm. and the most delicate thing in this movie is setting up whether or not you can trust Robert Redford. Yes. The hooker. Right. That is, and it is handled with such a deft touch. It is mm. so right on the line yeah. of exactly where it needs to be in this film. Yeah. And if you have Jack Nicholson instead of, cause I agree a hundred percent with you, mm. you initially will not trust him 
because no. he's Jackie's Nicholson. Right. And that is going to change that balance just enough that you won't get this magic. That's yeah. my feeling. Yeah. He might um, steal the scenes from Paul as well. Yeah. But, and by the way, David S. Ward is a fascinating guy. I mean, this was his second script to write something this incredible and your second script, right? And then does a really quietly unappreciated film from the 1980s with Robert Redford, the Malagro Beanfield War, then Major League. Then it becomes weird because then you get King Ralph, but then you get Sleepless in Seattle. And then he does the other, uh, does uh, Flyboys. And so it just, he had this heyday in the 70s and was still able to parlay to the occasional hit in the 80s and 90s, but never quite captured the level of artistry that you find in The Sting. You know, I, I, I just want to continually point out, like, this is why this is the evidence that making movies is really, 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 really fucking hard. Yeah. Is that like if you had I mean, I guess you have this in sports, too, where you have a player come along and they have a great season and then they kind of fizzle after that. That yes. certainly does happen. Yeah. But frequently statistics in sports are statistics. And you can see, OK, that person is that good mm -hmm. to some degree, I would think. Yeah. But but in movies, you could come along and make the sting. Yes. And just never be able to kind of put that together. Part of it is that Hollywood is so crazy and notes are so development is really crazy. And yeah. we never know the story of movies, but also it's so delicate. And this movie in particular is delicate. Yeah. So it goes to Redford and he reads it and he thinks it's great. He says, I believe that this needs a master filmmaker is that this needs someone who with an incredibly deft touch. And I'm totally supportive of David S. Ward directing it. But if he does, you have my blessing and I will not be in it. Wow. Yeah. Like, and, and I, and I respect like the way he, it sounds like he handled it really well. He's like, I want you to make a great movie. Personally, I think this needs, this, this can't be a first time director. Yeah. And so go for it. Yeah. And Universal basically goes, hmm, Robert Redford or not Robert Redford. <laughs> and so they decide, well, we're just going to, I think we're going to get a, a real director. And so yeah. uh, George Roy Hill comes on, no Paul Newman at first, mm. and it's just George Roy Hill. And at that time, the Gondorf part was much smaller. It was really a oh. hooker is the lead. It's not a two-hander. Right. It's a one-hander with a great supporting character. And the character of Gondorf is written as this heavy set over the hill, you know, guy, mm. not as this, not as Paul Newman. And uh, I'm going to go in later about how Paul Newman finally comes on the show when we meet him. But uh, uh, George does a lot of rewriting. He's working. This is Zanuck and Brown, who was, you know, one of the most storied uh, producing teams of the 70s um, are working with him. And, and what it sounds like is George Roy Hill was tough. Yeah. But in a way that it, it would, he wasn't tough the way like John Ford was tough. Mm. He was like, once he made a decision, that was the decision. Yeah. Um, and he definitely, definitely scared the studio people. Like they didn't, he was getting military background. They didn't like coming up against him because he was just really strong in what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. He had a two week rehearsal process and what it sounds, and everyone was there, including Newman right. and including Robert Shaw. And what it sounds like was that Newman and Redford both showed up really committed to playing characters in this ensemble and not being movie stars. That is oh. what I have heard. Well, that makes sense because they're both actors first, movie stars second. Yeah. Yeah. And and everyone, and I've heard, you know, Ray Walston and all, all, so all, all of these actors who came in, Charles Durning, and all of them said right from the rehearsal process, there was magic. Like they, yeah. they knew some. And, and apparently once they started the rehearsal process, basically they didn't change a word of this script. Wow. Um, shall we get into the film? Yeah, let's do it. I love that we start with that old time universal logo. Yeah. And then that music comes in yeah. and it is the sting. Yeah, the ragtime music. Marvin Hamlish, composer. By the way, one of my favorite people growing up as a young kid in the 1970s was Marvin Hamlish. Uh, because he would go on these Saturday morning shows. There was an ABC one. I can't remember. It was for kids. And he would play just impromptu stuff uh, uh, off the bat. Like, I think he would, he had a, he had a, uh, a segment where a kid would come up and write a story and he would put the story to music, right? Impromptu. Mm. It was incredible to watch 
the talent that Marvin Hamlish had. And of course, this is the, one of the beginning people in my life that turned me into an honorary Jewish person because I just <laughs> loved Marvin Hamlish and uh, I loved the way he presented things. And he always felt like this kind of fatherly slash uncle energy uh, when he was on these shows and uh, watching him with a piano was marvelous. So I was very happy when we watched the, when I watched the film with you guys 10, 10 years ago, uh, that Hamlish was the guy who was the composer for the score here. It, it's so, he's such an odd character at a very specific time. <laughs> yes. Because <isn't> he? <laughs> he's not, in, in a way, he becomes the busy, biggest thing in music, right? Around this, yes. you know, between this uh, and going all the way to a chorus line, you know, and they're playing our song and all, you know, it's like, and he's uh, becomes a celebrity and he's on The Tonight Show and he's, as you said, playing piano and all this stuff. Yeah. It's just this strange, I will say, kind of nerdy Jewish guy. <laughs> and yet he becomes super cool yeah. for this brief period of time. Yeah. And of course we'll get into, we'll say it when we get to the very end, but he's also an EGOT, you yes. know? Yes. And I will say next to like the Nobel peace prize, the EGOT <laughs> being an EGOT is pretty damn cool. Yes, it is. Um, I'd say, I would say they go like Nobel peace prize, congressional medal of honor, EGOT, EGOT. <laughs> in, in my rankings. Yeah. Um, and by the way, so how here's how here's how this music came along, which is George Roy Hill apparently was quite a good piano player. Mm. And he discovered Scott Joplin about halfway through making this movie right. and started playing it and started playing ragtime. He played it for Redford on the piano. He goes to David S. Ward, says, I want to use this for the music. And of course, David S. Ward goes, that's crazy. <laughs> ragtime is the totally wrong era. It's that's like turn of the century, 1908, 1910. Yeah, this movie yeah. takes place in the thirties. He <laughs> Ward had been listening to nothing but like classic blues from the thirties as he was writing this thing. He's like, this music is totally wrong. Yeah. And basically what uh, George Roy Hill said to him, he's like, you are one of the only people who actually knows where this music is from. It doesn't matter when the music is from. It matters how the music feels. Yeah. So he brings it to Marvin Hamlish and he goes, I want the score to be based on Scott Joplin and ragtime and Hamlish immediately. It sounds like keys into what it is, which is yeah. that ragtime is telling you, it tells you specifically, this is fun. Yeah. You're yeah. going to have fun with this. It's enjoyable. And it's, and, and he, so he's composing for the movie and, and, and I think the way the music we'll get into it as we go mm. along, but the way it fits in the music movie is very different. Because just like in Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, as you remember, yeah. mentioned, he doesn't want to score under dialogue. So it's yeah. always, when we go to the music, we go to a musical section. Yes. You know what I mean? It's very different. And so Hamlish is composing the score, and George goes, I would like to play it on the recording session, the oh. director. And Hamlish is kind of like, I'm a pretty good piano player. <laughs> I kind of think I should be the one playing it. Yeah. And basically they said, whoever gets to the piano first gets yeah. to play it on the next session. And Hamlish just made sure he was always an hour early to the recording sessions. <laughs> so he had staked out the piano. So George Roy Hill would stay the hell away from it. Wow. That's the, you know, but that's the, I don't know. That's the hubris, right? Of someone like George Roy Hill and, because I mean, Marvin was a child prodigy. Like yeah. at five years old, he was. He got into a pre Juilliard school at seven years old. For God's wow. sake, wow! This this is the kind. He was like Amadeus in a way, because as we remember from that scene where he is playing the march that Salieri is just achingly yes, yes. come up with. Yeah. Marvin Hamlish was doing it at five years old wow. on a piano. He was like listening to songs, and as the songs were playing, he was he was doing the notes when he was listening for the first time. Wow. He was doing the notes on the piano just from listening to it the first time. And so he just had this gift, you know? Wow. So the arrogance of George. I mean, why not <laughs> let Marvin shoot a few scenes there, George? Yeah, George. Yeah, George. Uh, uh, and then we get these beautiful title cards that we'll see throughout mm -hmm. the film. Uh, these are drawn by uh, Jaroslav, who's known as Jerry Gieber. And, he, and the whole idea was to have them look like those classic covers of the Saturday Evening Post. Yeah. You know? And they, again, like the music, were being put into this time and place. And then we go through and see film of all the credits, which I love, yeah. you know, of Newman and the Tux. And we see Redford with his flowers, Robert Shaw at the poker game, and go through them all. And I think this sets up. It's so funny because I think this is a very different movie from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and 100%. completely sets up its own feeling and yeah. its own flair yeah. right at the beginning. Yeah, and I think they're making it very clear this is not Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. This is something completely different. 
Yep. Um, it's much more proper in its approach. Yet it does have like you know uh, uh, con games going on, but it's much more proper in how it's approaching it. The music comes to an end, and now we're at Juliet, Illinois. It's in September 1936, and the camera moves in, and we see this is the Depression. And yeah. beat up cars and trash on the ground and torn coats. And we watch the shoes walking as they go up these stairs. Spats. 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 I love nice. Yeah. And most of this was shot on the Universal Backlot. Oh, nice. And it's great. The set it looks so good. It looks so much like The Sting. 100% dude. Yeah. And it's very much the art director is Henry Bumstead. The cinematographer is Robert L. Surtees. Mm -hmm. And they worked really hard on dividing, creating this color palette of muted browns and mm -hmm. maroons and the way the lighting work and all of it combines to make it's so interesting because whenever you shoot a period piece it is always that era's version of that period mm -hmm. and this is the stings version of the 1930s depression you know yeah and joliet of course is the name used by john belushi and in, in the blues brothers joliet jake joliet it's jake a, a shout out to illinois yeah yeah so we see this guy head up into this room where there's all this gambling go on past the secretary or into a phone call. And we see, of course, the old fashioned phones and all that stuff. Yeah. And there we see Combs, who I think is Arch Johnson mm -hmm. is the actor. And he's on a phone call with someone talking about some money deal and that they've had some problems. Arch Johnson, if some of you may remember him from G.I. Blues, uh, the Elvis Presley movie. Uh, one of his last few roles was in uh, Roddy Dangerfield's Easy Money uh, movie, which some of you may have watched. But yeah, an actor, a veteran actor has been a number of TV shows from the uh, 60s and 70s um, and uh, done occasional pop-ins on movies. And this is one of those uh, moments where you catch him in something uh, here on, on, a, on a theater, in a theater. And it doesn't really matter what the phone call's about. There's something about money and how much yeah. money they're bringing in and that they have to get the cash up to somewhere. And finally, at the end of it, we we call up uh, Matolda, who's their runner, and says, yeah. hey, you got to take this up to Chicago on the 415. Uh, and he hands him this big envelope filled with money. But already establishing, like, this is, uh, there's an operation going on, and they're falling behind because the exchange on the phone with these guys, Granger and... Uh, the other dude is uh, is all about the fact that their area, Joliet there, is not holding up their end of the bargain. All the other cities are over or performing or overperforming or performing better than they are. And so that you, you're, you're already setting up a bit of a competitive nature within this uh, operation. Uh, and then Matola's got to take it. But of course, you're seeing him also be a little uh, of a jerk, a little bit of a jerk to the receptionist, the female receptionist that he's mm, answering yeah. the phone. So you get the sense that there's this is a different time. This is a different world. And so you get a, a glimpse into it right off the bat to set the mood for the rest of the movie. So uh, Matolda goes off with his stack of money in his jacket pocket, heads down the stairs, and suddenly, just as we're out there, we're hey, hey, you stop there. Stop him. He's got my wallet. Stop him. Stop that man. He's got all my money. And we see it's, it's the middle of a, of a crime. You don't always think of it, by the way. This is the beginning of Spider-Man, which is whether or not he stops that criminal running oh, yeah. out. It's totally that moment. Yeah. And are we going to stop the guy that's robbed this uh, African-American gentleman who's on the ground? Mm -hmm. Yells he's got his wallet. And Redford, who's standing there, throws this suitcase, knocks out the guy's legs. He gets up with a knife, but then ends up running away, limping. Yeah. Uh, leaving the wallet on the ground. So, Steve, the yes. first time you watched this, did you know this was a setup? Can you remember wondering if this was a setup? Because, I mean, I, I think I had I can't. No I couldn't tell you. I couldn't yeah. tell you if I remember that because I was probably too little. What, what about you? What do you it, think? I, yeah, I, I had no idea it was a con the yeah. first time I watched it, right? Because you're like, it's so well played off. And uh, the key, uh, the uh, eerie kid who we find out is the one who was pulling the knife on Robert because it's all a con. Uh, you, had, you just didn't know that that was a person that would that this whole thing was set up with these three, especially yep. when you have a black, an older black gentleman being a part of it. You're like, wait, what at this time? Really? Yep. So there is, you have the questions initially. And then when you find out it's a con, it's like, oh man, that's genius. It's so funny thinking about the mechanisms of, of a con hmm. and, and, and where I really learned it, I had watched this movie and over and over again, Yeah. but yeah. then it's the movie house of games, the, with Joe oh, Mantegna, the, the, um, uh, David Mamet film. Yeah where Joe Mantegna explains a confidence game. The basic idea is this. It's called a confidence game. Why? Because you give me your confidence? No, 
because I give you mine. <laughs> is that the key to the confidence game is that the con man trusts the mark. Right. They make the mark feel trust and that they also are banking on the mark's desires. Yeah. The, the mark has to be the one that makes the thing work. And this is why, and I'll, I'll talk about it more as we go along. Mm. I think the fact that, so my first movie that I wrote that got made was called Stonebrook, and it starred Seth Green mm. and Brad Rowe and Stanley Camel, and it's a con artist movie. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that that was my first film was the greatest screenwriting lesson I could ever have in my life. Oh, interesting. And the reason is, is because the way a con works is that you have to understand the other person's motivations mm -hmm. and manipulate their motivations so that they want, in one way or another, to give you their money. Yes. They have to want to do that. And understanding the layers of what motivates somebody to want to do something is the secret. That's the central lesson of screenwriting. Yeah. Why does someone want to do it? It's motivation, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think we all are con men and con women to a certain yes. degree, right? Exactly. Aren't you? Aren't you? That like, is my point. Yes. When you're putting on your best suit for that first yep. day or your best outfit for that first day or you're wearing the right cologne, in essence, that's a con. You, when you're trying to present the best parts of yourself in an interview, in essence, that's a con. You know, so there's there's all kinds of versions of how we we uh, perform little cons in our lives. Not necessarily to you know steal money from people, but certainly to get something well, you know well they're not necessarily dishonest no right but you exactly. always want people we always care how people receive us or feel right. about us right. we always want to get the job or get you know we want someone to like us we want that's what we want all the time mm. you know and so like and the thing about the reason that a con movie is so great in terms of a screenwriter right is because you have to track everything on multiple levels because and this is what right. is central to this whole movie, a movie is that for this what makes this movie work is that all the motivations of the con work perfectly yeah. and all the motivations behind the con work perfectly. Mm. So every, and it, they work on every, because at some point there are three or four levels, which is right. what makes this a super hard screenplay to write. Right. So like, because it has to make sense all the way down. And when you look at it, it's just like The Sixth Sense or any other film that you have to be able to watch it the second time and go, does it still all work? Yeah. Oh yeah, it all still works. Right. And that's really, really hard. So we've just taken out this guy that's robbed this person. His wallet's on the floor. Mm -hmm. The crook runs away. And we get the wallet back to this uh, this actor who looks strangely familiar. This guy that's been mugged. He isn't exactly a famous person that I know, <laughs> but he really looks familiar, John. Yeah. Who is this? He looks familiar and he sounds familiar for those of you who maybe uh, were like, wait, why does that sound like? Yes, it sounds like James Earl Jones. Why? Because that is James Earl Jones's dad. Uh, Robert Earl Jones here, um, uh, you know, fantastic actor who is also on the stage, performed with his son a few times on stage as well. He was in uh, The Sting, obviously, Sleepaway Camp, Witness, or some of the movies that he was a part of. He was a one-time sparring partner for Joe Lewis in 1937 uh, before he dropped out of all of that to pursue acting. So uh, an interesting uh, gentleman and a fantastic actor himself who was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Black Theater Festival. Um, and here's another part of his history. He was, um, and I didn't know this, that this happened to black actors. He was blacklisted in the early 1950s and was called before the House of Un-American Activities Committee to HUAC uh, because of his involvement in the leftist movement of the late 1930s. So kind of wow. crazy. Um, and then ran the New York City Marathon uh, several times up until 1996. So there you Until go. 96? How old? 96. So when, what year was he born? Uh, 1910. So he was 86. 86. He died wow. in 2006. Let that sink in. Wow. Yeah. That's, that is crazy. Hey, you said title, man. You need a doctor. I'll call a cop. No, 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 no cops. And immediately, Redford is suspicious. You want to buy the law or something? And we see that there's a ton of cash in his wallet. And of course, we see that this other runner also sees a ton of cash. Are you nuts carrying a water around like that in a neighborhood like this? No wonder you got hit. Thanks. I'm obliged to you, but I got to get going. And he tries to get up, falls down, and then we hear that he is actually running some slots for the mob or something, and he got behind on his payoffs. He's got a bunch of money. He's got to get it to him by four, or he's going to get killed. It don't look good, Gramps. It's almost four now. I'll give you and your friend a hundred bucks to deliver it for me. 
And this is the thing. He's got $5,000 in this thing. We think it's $5,000. Of course, it's really just mostly paper. <laughs> and he's got, and he needs it delivered and he's offering a hundred bucks. And this is, again, what is the motivation he's playing on with the mark, which is the mark's greed. Yep. So Redford, whose name is Johnny Hooker, by the way, says he's not interested. How about you? All you got to do is to put it in the dough slot. I'll give you the whole hundred. Hey, what makes you think you can trust him? He didn't do shit. Hey, butt out, chicken liver. I gave him back the wallet, didn't I? And he gets the info. He gets the address. Okay, old man, I'll make your drop for you. And don't worry. You can trust me. And then Redford goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And this is where the con happens. If those goons decide to search you, you ain't gonna get far carrying it there. What'll we do? You got a bag or something? How about a handkerchief? Here's a handkerchief. Here, give it to me. Wait, wait, do you got any other money? You don't want your other money to get stolen. <laughs> so this guy takes the envelope out of his jacket, which has 10 or 11 grand or whatever it is, yeah. sticks it in with the paper. Redford sticks it into his pants, says, Ain't a tough guy in the world that's gonna frisk you there. Which, by the way, I completely disagree. <laughs> I, think, I think tough guys will frisk anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then he reaches back into his pants, pulls out what we think is the same wad of papers, yeah. hands it to him. He sticks it down his pants, runs off, jumps in a cab. And then this is the this is the trick to maybe the whole movie, which is that we don't want to watch our bad guys be criminals. I mean, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are criminals, and they skate that really well by having Butch be so affable and they never want to kill anybody. Right. Here, these are also criminals, but the big thing is they're only in the course of the movie mm. robbing bad guys because what happens when the guy gets in the cab? Yeah. He says, Which way is Mason? 20 blocks south. Okay, go north. Jody Station. Fat. Right. He was going to steal the money. Yeah, totally. And they knew this. And th I'm sure they cased him. I'm sure they uh, asked around town about this guy. And they knew what his, as you said, with a, con a good con, you got to understand what the motivations of the other person is. And they clearly knew this guy was uh, going to be greedy and would fall for it easily. What's so funny? I just made the world's easiest five grand. He reaches into his pants. He pulls out that wad of paper. And guess what? It's just a wad of paper. It's just Walter's undies. It's just Walter's undies. It's just undies, Walter's dude. undies. <laughs> the whites. Whites. <laughs> um, so here's the first thing that I stole. So oh. in Stonebrook, which I don't even know if it's available on streaming, but I right. still, it's a pretty good movie. I wrote a con, which was a pool hustle. Mm -hmm. And I stole an element of this con for that pool hustle, which is what the real crime is, is that Redford swi switches the packages. Yeah. That's what's really happening. He already has an, a package of empty paper down his pants. Yeah. He puts this one down his pants, pulls the empty one out and hands it to the guy. That's the actual con. So here was the con I did in Stonebrook because I wanted to do a pool hustle. And so there is a pool, a, a hustler. And what a hustler does is they lose a bunch of games and then get the bet really high and then win the games. So I had my main characters go up against a pool hustler. And they were winning several games and getting the bet high. And then the whole point was they were going to lose the bet. And then Seth Green, who's kind of the mastermind of the whole thing, was going to do an envelope swap. Exactly what's Ooh. in this movie. Oh, wow. Um, and so we're the director is I'm the writer, I'm on the set, the director's directing it, and he's just having our main character win the pool game. And mm. I'm like, no, you've misunderstood the con. <laughs> the whole point is that he can't win the pool game because that's a pool. I remember just being on the set trying to explain the con to the director who didn't understand it so that he could shoot it in the right way. <laughs> So we're running away. It's after the con. Of course, Luther, who had been down on the ground bleeding a minute before, mm -hmm. is running no problem. They're laughing about how great it was. He reaches into this envelope, pulls it out, and holy crap. He, that's a lot of money. Luther. Good God. We're millionaires. Jesus. Did you know is that loaded? Hell no. I just cut into him. I would have settled for pawning one of them shoes. <laughs> so they look down, and it's 10 grand, which is from 1936 is $226,000 today. Yeah. Can you imagine you just ripped some guy off for 226 grand? Yeah. You know what's crazy? Knowing today, <laughs> it wouldn't even feel like a million. It wouldn't even remotely feel like a million dollars. But yeah, it would be nice to get $226,000 off of one <laughs> afternoon's work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what Jeff Bezos makes like every minute. So Every second, probably. Yeah, it's something like that. And it's obvious from the relationship that uh, Redford is the kid, you know? Yeah. Like he's partners with Luther and he's like the young hot kid. Yes. 
Uh, which brings us to a question from patron Laura Brody, who says, I heard one critic say that Robert Redford was a little long in the tooth to play the kid role in The Sting. What's your reaction to this? That's a great question. I mean, we're not that far removed from Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Theater. It's like four years later. But Redford has done a, quite a few movies in that span of time and certainly has come into his own as an actor in that span of time. So I can see how critics might have felt this way, right? Because look at Jeremiah Johnson and the candidate and the way we were are all around this time. And so is downhill racer. So you could argue that he has gotten, but, but, but Redford has always had that face of his that is <clears throat> kind of older than it actually is. Do you know what I'm saying? And it serves him well in the candidate because he comes across as kind of this green guy in terms of the politics, but then eventually the seasoning happens and he kind of embraces things by the end. So I, I think in this way, it, it still kind of works because Newman is older, so it still makes it feel like he's the kid. And I think having him be with someone like uh, Robert Earl Jones, Luther there, who radiates an older energy, obviously, it helps him like stay young by comparison, so to speak. So I have several thoughts about this. The first is, is that uh, in a few weeks, we're going to be jumping into a role where Redford is clearly too old, which is for the first act of The Natural. Yes. True. And yet I completely accept him in that role yeah. 100%, despite the fact that it doesn't make sense. Right. What's so interesting to me, and we'll get to it when we get to Newman as well, is that in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Butch is older than Sundance. Yes. But they are peers. Right. right. You know? And here, it's, you know, four years later in the real world, yeah. we're going to be in a movie where Newman is cast as significantly older than right. Redford. Right. And it 100% works for me. I don't bump on this at all. Okay. And I really go, I think, if you want to see, like, yeah, there are great, all sorts of great performances in the world. And I'm not saying that Newman and Redford in The Sting or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid should be listed as our great performances. Right, right, right. I mean, they're great. I love them. But they're not like, you don't go like, oh, this is, you know. Right. Denzel Washington in. in um, training <laughs> Training Day, yeah. Training Day was what I was trying to come up with. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't put these performances there. But if, I, if you want to see the art of the actor, watch yeah. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and then watch The Sting. Same two guys. Mm -hmm. Same charisma, same star energy of Newman and Redford. Yeah. Different characters. Yeah. They're, they're just different. I think Redford can act. That's why he doesn't seem too old to me. Also, just because you're called a kid doesn't mean you're a kid, right? Especially right. in a world, ironically, Redford was born in 1936. So this is his birth year where oh, wow. this, this is set. So, you know, I would argue that although he may be a little, maybe a little bit long in the tooth for it, uh, it's not Im meant to imply that he's a child. It's meant to imply right. that he's still new in the game or got in the game when he was young and just kept the nickname, so to speak. Yeah, I, I don't bump on this at all. And, and then we go, we see Redford. He goes off. We're listening to that great music. He buys a new suit. He buys some flowers. He's looking very <laughs> stylish in his way. Heads off to the ye old burlesque house backstage where he's obviously knows people and has been there before. Oh, he knows and people. <laughs> he knows people and there he's waiting for i won't say it's his girl but Ooh. for a dancer who is on stage to come off and that is sally kirkland yes a young sally kirkland shaking it there on the stage and this is a great like window into this guy right he pulls this con he's super excited about the money so is obviously luther but the first thing he does is exactly what robert de niro told you not to do in goodfellow yep he went and got a, a Cadillac for his in his mom's name. A fur. <laughs> he just went and did all this stuff, like go get the spats. How are you not going to stand out and show people that you know that you came into this money? It's it's so stupid what he does here, but he looks dapper as hell, and he walks in with his confidence, like you get used to seeing me like this. You guys are going to see me like this. But look, um, Crystal's not even that impressed. No, and she wants to stay and do. She even says to him, what are you marrying somebody? So even she knows she's not his girl or doesn't want to be his girl. Nope. And she wants to work the other shift later on that night for $5. Uh, so clearly, you know, he's living in some kind of fantasy land of what he thinks this money is going to do to his life, you know? And I think the key to it is what you just said, which is that she knows that she's not his girl. Yeah. And he knows that this isn't his girl. Exactly. Right. He's right. just living in this fantasy, this moment. 
And I love where she's like, no, I got to work. I need the five bucks. And he says, I'll spend 50 on you. Yeah. And she's like, in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they so they head out. They go into this bar. There's all this gambling. They go up to a roulette wheel. Booker, I ain't seen you in months. Thought maybe you took a fall. Huh? Nah, just a little hard times is all. Everything's jake now, though. And they think he's going to put 10 bucks down on, on, on something, on the roulette wheel. Yeah. He, he pulls out the entire wad of cash. And he throws three thousand dollars down on red. Yeah, and it's just like so. Again, it's just because I, you know, I looked up what the what the ten grand is. Well, if you do your math, three thousand dollars is sixty seven thousand eight hundred and eighty six dollars. Good God, good it's so, God! Isn't it? It's funny too how we think about money because I had the reaction of you of like, okay, quarter of a million dollars. It's, not, it's a lot of money. Yeah, but you said that's not like getting a million. You know, Nowadays. but yeah. the idea of gambling. $66,000 on one throw is n particularly when you're broke and hooker's broke. He is broke. Yeah. This is, this is several years of worth of money for him that he throws down for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yep. Hooker, hooker. I can't accept that. It's too big a bet. There's a house limit. Take it. But hooker here. Take it. And there's a look and they run the roulette and we see him reach down under the table and push a button and the ball ends up on black. And this is a hint to what is going to happen through this entire movie, in that everything is a frame. Everything is a cheat. And so we're getting, like, from the first con that we got that we just talked about e to uh, this moment here and going forward. It, it, all these people are involved in a cheat, in a system of cheating, yet all of them get upset when the other one cheats, cheats them. Do you know what I'm saying? They're all... A part of this, and we'll see that in the card game with, with uh, Robert Shaw's character later on in in, in the uh, discussion. So yeah, I, a I think that's a fantastic point. B mm. Hooker came in, and this guy recognized him. They talked about him throwing a ten spot down or something. Right? Has Hooker come and this guy cheated for him in the past? I think so. Uh, so do I. I. I think so, and he's helped him out when he could. Right? And this is asking too much of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it was like, hey, you come down, you bet ten, you make you make thirty bucks, you throw me five. Yeah, we and all that's got, it's it was, all cost of doing business, right. right? And then Hooker walks in and throws down three grand. Yeah, and it's like, dude, I can't, I'm gonna get killed. I can't do that. Which is what he says right afterwards. Yeah, I couldn't He's, do that. Man. Lucky for me, it came up Black Hooker. I feel like you get in big trouble around here losing a bet like that. And, and what's interesting too is that Hooker realizes it. Don't worry about it, pal. It was my mistake. There's always more with that game. Which actually, you know, I'm so, I hadn't thought about it, but until you brought it up, mm. you're 100 percent right because this it's not just that we see cheating throughout. This is the end of the movie. This oh, is yes. Hooker has just yeah. lost the big bet to the cheat, yep. and uh, and knows that he's been cheated. Right. And unlike Doyle, mm -hmm. he goes, oh, "It's okay." Yeah. One last piece of wonderful movie trivia: this roulette table with the button under it mm -hmm. was used in a little movie called Casablanca. Oh, same roulette table. And Crystal, Sally Kirkland, is just like... She's so pissed. Oh, my God. I mean, first of all, if you take the girl out and you promise to spend 50 on her, you yeah. got to spend the 50 before you blow the three grand. Right, exactly. You know? Blow all... And cost her her $5. Yeah, exactly. She made working that night. Though she probably could have gotten back in time to do the 10 o'clock show, but who knows? You still yeah. cost the money. Thanks for the big evening, hooker. On, Next time you want to spend 50 board. bucks on me, mail it. Come on, would you... <laughs> and she's gone uh, Sally so unrecognizable in this role totally. um, and of course goes on to do a bunch of things and Anna is the big movie in Sally Kirkland's career that, that's what gets her nominated for like Golden Globes and, uh, and what have you so but kept working consistently through a number of years through, into the 90s and whatever so a good good actress Tom Matola he was drunk in a dive in Joliet he never got on the train I don't want to hear about his day, Greer. What happened to the money? He lost it to a couple of con artists on his way out of the spot. Okay. I better get on the phone to New York. See what the big Mick wants to do about it. We're just setting up what the what the conflict is going to be. We go to this very fancy-looking casino. We follow a runner who gets the phone call, whispers to this henchman who is Floyd, Mm -hmm. uh, and this guy has a fascinating face, and I feel like I've seen him recently. Uh, that is Charles Deerkop, who you're talking about there. Uh, a f interesting cat 
He was also in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Ah, uh, yes, I yeah. have seen him recently. <laughs> so I think that's uh, where you saw him. Not, I mean, not too much of note past those films, I guess, that, uh, you know, when I was doing a little bit of research for him, uh, certainly found his way into doing 80s TV like Chips and Fantasy Island and TJ Hooker and all of that and uh, did Silent Night, Deadly Night. He played Killer Santa. That may uh-huh. be another claim to fame that he has playing the Killer Santa in that particular movie. But before he did those movies uh, with Butch Cassidy and with the sting, he was a consistent uh, booker of uh, shows in the 1970s and sixties as well. Even played, uh, even was in a Batman show in 1968, one of the episodes of Batman and all. And for those of you who uh, need to know what character he was in Butch Cassidy and Sundance kid, he was flat nose Curry, which of course, who of course was against Butch and then was all about Butch once he beat Harvey Logan. So, yeah. I think I remember, I remember uh, Frank Capra talking about how important it was with supporting characters to cast voices and faces. Mm. And if you think of a Capra movie, you have like the guy, I think this guy's got to do, you know, or that the, I actually, the voice is similar to major league with what's his name. Like Lou, that, Lou Brown, yeah. Lou Brown is like, that's casting a voice. And yeah. sometimes you cast a face where every time you see that face, it is just, and that's what I think Floyd mm-hmm. is in this movie is that he doesn't have a lot of lines. But he has a presence because his face is so interesting to look at, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and we can see he doesn't want to bring the bad news to the big boss. He walks up to Robert Shaw's back and whispers to him. And this is the first glimpse we get of one of, it's amazing that Robert Shaw does this and then jo- does Jaws back to back. Yeah. I right. mean, yeah. and, and, and I, I will just say, and I'm sure you probably have information on Mr. Shaw, but <laughs> initially... Yeah. Um, George Roy Hill wanted Richard Boone to play Lonigan. Oh, interesting. I don't get that at all. Richard Boone? Wow. And from what and from what I understand, Paul Newman secretly yeah. sent the script to Robert Shaw without talking to George Roy Hill about it <laughs> because he thought this is who should play it. Shaw reads the script and his comment was delicious. When do <laughs> I start? <laughs> By the way, if you want to do yourself a favor, go and find old interviews with Robert Shaw, like on the Dick Cavett show. And they're all on YouTube. I've I've fallen into wormholes with Robert Shaw because, I mean, to me, he's never done anything better than Quint. And even when I go back and watch him in Taken of Pelham, which he did right after this movie, it was it was this was the the three a pretty good run here because he had the sting right into the taking of Pelham one, two, three, and then right into Jaws. And that's a that's a two year window where that all happens. Uh, for him and i think that's our and then uh, yeah he's in robin of Ma- robin and marion and the deep which i think is great force 10 from navarone and what have you before and then, and then of course um uh passes away in 1978 at the very young age of 51 um but like when you watch him in these uh, interviews he's an incredibly intelligent dude oh, yeah. but you can tell you don't want to fuck with this guy no. so no. he's <laughs> such a perfect choice for this character to play Lonergan here, I, I think he's such an excellent choice. And I'm telling you, rewatching the movie again for our show, and we're going to get to the scene obviously a little bit later in, in our conversation. But when Paul Newman it's the is greatest making scene the fun of him throughout the whole card game, the, I I'm on the edge of my seat. Like I'm like, stop, stop doing this. You're going to get killed. Stop it. You know that scene. That is the scene of the movie. Yeah, like that. That scene in it. We'll get to it. Obviously, we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I would. T- I taught that scene in class. Like oh, so, really? And, and that to me, more. like, yeah. the, not only is it the scene of the movie, it is a perfect short film. That, oh yeah, that sequence just taken oh. out of context or anything else, it is perfect. And I agree with you. It is so str- It manages to be. We'll get to it, but yeah, so yeah. stressful and so fun yeah. at the same time. Yeah. But right now, Floyd is telling him about this, uh, the runner that got knocked over by a couple of grifters. Have some local people taking out of them. Nothing fancy. You gotta discourage this kind of thing. Yafala. 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 <laughs> it's just one of the great, great little bits that we get in a movie, you know? Yeah. Redford heads up the stairs in this old tenement, and you can see, and again, I love these kinds of moments. He's just lost his three grand. Yeah. And so the moment before he knocks on the door, he takes a second to bring himself together. Because, again, it's like you said at the beginning, every, everyone is conning everybody all the time. Yep. And this is his con. Now he has to perform like he's happy and that he didn't lose all his money. And you mirror this before Paul Newman walks, juxtapose this scene rather to before yes. Paul Newman walks into have that card game. He also yep. takes that moment 
breathes it out and then goes in and stumbles in there and does his whole act, you know, but yeah, that whole, that's an actor's thing. The moment before you exactly. walk on stage, it's basically that was, what they're showing you. I literally was going to say the th- same thing because is in addition to like why I think con movies are so good for screenwriters, yeah. con movies are all about actors. Yeah. True. These guys are all actors. That yeah. is who they are. Yep. And in not, and in another circumstance, but they might've become actors. Yeah. You know, right. Good point. Um, so he gets welcomed in and this is Luther's family and they are super thrilled to see him. I love the little dance that Robert Redford does, <laughs> you know, and it's just, and they, uh, it's, ob- it's so obvious that this is Hooker's family. Yeah. Deep, right. deep family. Right. And it was interesting. So uh, David S. Ward, as I said, was listening to classic blues from the thirties when he wrote the script. And mm. that is why Luther and his family are black is because those are the voices he was listening to. And again, you know, we talked about race and we're not going to get into race in this right, right. talking about this thing, but like, I love that. It's just given yeah. that this is family. Yeah. There's just no, he just, they, they love each other and that's it. You know? And think about the time of this movie, 1973, right? I mean, the civil rights bill was just nine, what? No, five years. What was the civil 64? I guess nine years ago, nine years before, you know, we were starting to see Sidney Poitier is coming in, uh, through the late 60s into the 70s being a, a, a name here. So we're seeing this idea of having, because I mean, remember at the opening, Mato, uh, was it Mato? No, no, it was the uh, the, the eerie kid playing the con yeah. who uses the N-word, you know, yeah. N-lover. You know, he says that right in the opening few scenes of the film. And then we see the fact that he is, of course, very much uh, connected to and embraced and loved by this family. I imagine Luther found Hooker on the Streets he was a young white kid whose family had abandoned him. And I imagine Luther taught him a trade in order to be able to survive. Totally. And 100%. It's very much a father figure in this situation, which is why you understand why. If you factor that in, I think that's why Hooker does all the things he does in the entire movie is because this was essentially his father figure. Maybe his only father figure. You know? I, I, I 100% think that's what it is. It, and it's not just that. It's like... I mean, his conversation with, I think Alva is her name, yeah. the, the wife. Yeah. And, and and when we find out that, oh, Alva used to, is a con artist. Yes. And she ran the same con and they're discussing how fast you are getting the bundles in and out and how they did it. And, yeah. and, and, and what I love, I love, there's so, th- this is an incidental scene in the sense that there's not critical story points that are happening here. Right. But all the dialogue is so great because first we have that great conversation about, Alva being a con artist, but then we also have this thing that they're going to head off to church or like, oh, they're going to church. Isn't that interesting? The con artist going to church, but they're going to church to, uh, to play bingo, yeah. <laughs> which essentially is gambling in this. It's not gambling, like throwing down $3,000 on roulette, but it's still gambling. And they're talking about that. And then I love too, that they, they're, we were listening on the radio, them closing in on machine gun Kelly yeah. and Alva says, well, Hey, Hooker. Can't help you, Leroy. You can't beat the house. (laughs) Because they're on the side of the criminals. Like, there's so many little details in this scene that are super fun. And I want to give a quick shout out to Pauline Myers, who plays Alva. For those of you who have ever seen my cousin Vinny, she is the lady who has to wear the glasses. Who initially, she's the one that, like, at the end, they go, you you do need glasses, don't you, ma'am? She is the little young, uh, little older black lady who has to admit that she needed glasses but this is a woman who worked from the 1950s on uh in or 1940s on in in uh, theater and uh, sorry in film and television so she certainly had a very strong resume uh and that was her last role the my cousin Vinny role was her oh, last wow. role on screen yeah um and so they had the family heads off to church and he goes over to see luther and kid erie who are sitting down playing some dominoes does he look familiar to you he definitely looks familiar to me the erie kid can't. jack kehoe that's the uh the accountant in uh, in uh, the Untouchables. I'll talk. I'll oh, talk. that's the guy at the end, uh, or not near the end, but the guy they uh, get in the subway station there with oh. the whole baby going down the steps. He is the accountant that goes and uh, tells everything. Uh, Jack Hugh, he was also in Serpico and in Midnight Run. Remember, he's the guy who helps. He is. Yes. Right. Uh, is it who's is it Joey Pants? Who's Joey the, Pants? Yeah. 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 He's the guy helping Joey Pants. So yeah. he's the. I'll go get some donuts. That's right. That's yeah. right, who's, who's uh, telling all, uh, to Farina yeah. about the situation. Yeah. So w- one thing that occurred to me this time that had never occurred to me before, because he hands them out their shares. Yes. And I was like, oh, when he lost his three grand, he had their shares in his pocket. Yep. And did not. And I think, and it's, it, it went over my head every time I'd seen it until this time, but I go mm-hmm. like, oh, 
that's one more piece of the honor among thieves. Yep. Is that he might be a criminal. But he's an honor. He would. I don't think it would ever even have occurred to him to rip off Luther, Luther and right. Kittery. Right. And I think also, it, it, and it's not written in the script, but I think also a black man walking around at that time with yeah. that much money, sure. that's asking to get killed by the police or a, other or other white people discover it uh, and what have you. Um, and then, and it, the, clearly, the eerie, the eerie kid is too nervous to be caring. So it has yeah. to be. Uh, has him. to be Redford. Yeah. yeah, has to be Redford. Yeah. You're late. Where you been? I had a couple of appointments, sir. How much did you lose? <laughs> and I love Redford's kind of grimace and just kind of, yeah. uh, all of it. In one goddamn night? What are you spraying men around like that for? You could have been Neil. Uh, I checked the place first. There weren't no dicks in there. But you're a con man and you blew it like a pimp. I think that's a great not the pimp distinction necessarily, but like, it's like the idea of someone who makes his living manipulating other people into foolishly losing their money Yeah, for him to foolishly lose his money is stupid. You know, yes. he should be called out. Well, and that's what I mean about the fatherly energy. That's something yeah. a father would say to us. Why'd you do that stupid stuff? Come on. No class grifter would have done it. That's all. You think my play is bad. And there's a pause and man, Robert Earl Jones's smile when he says, I think you're the best. It's great. Yeah. Particularly, as you said, this is a father figure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I wouldn't be getting out otherwise. What the hell are you talking about? I'm getting too old for this racket. You hang on too long and you start embarrassing yourself. So he's retiring. Yeah. Last day on the job. And this is also where we start to hear about the big con. That this is just small time stuff. And he thinks that Hooker should be on the big con. But you played the big con. You told me yourself it was some dumb game for Mama's Boys and Flakes. <laughs> Hell, I never played no big con. So I love the introduction of the big con. Yeah. The idea that, because we've, we've never heard this term. That's not oh. a term that, you know, it's like, oh, there's the, because we saw the con. We understood what just happened. Yes. And now we hear there's this thing called the big con. It's like, you know what it is? I hadn't thought about it until this moment. What's that? It's like playing, it's like playing in the show. Yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. the this is the Super Bowl or yeah. the Major League Baseball level of of con artists. Right now, yeah. now I have a chance to step out when I'm ahead. Come on, what would you do with yourself? Oh, I have a brother down in KC runs a freight outlet. I can go halves with him. It ain't too exciting. I, I like that he says, but it's mostly legal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you knew he was dead. This is this is this is a kid totally. going. You know, when I leave the wall, I'm going to take Peggy for a ride and get those hot dogs at Coney Island. Bang! Uh, you know, Today right? it's my last day. I'm retiring. Yeah, I get retired. to hang up the badge. Exactly. Yeah, you're dead. I want to work with you, Luther. I'm out, Johnny. By the way, there are things that happen in this movie editorially. Yeah. That are illegal for all editors working today. Okay. Which is all of these. It's not just wipes. But it's yeah. all these folds and spins and squeezes. And they're all these things. What happened is this was kind of really cool when the yeah. Sting did it. All these weird transitions. Right. Um, particularly because they have sometimes those uh, Saturday evening post stills that we're moving off oh, yeah. of. And it's really yeah. neat. Those are cool. And then when the very first computer video systems got created in the early 90s, Ooh. they all were buttons. Oh, you can do a page turn or you can do a squeeze <laughs> or a flip or a slide or a diagonal. Yeah. And every terrible wedding videographer in the world used these things constantly. And then you got like the star dissolve and all these things wow. until by the time that I got to film school, it was like, you are not allowed <laughs> to touch any of those buttons because they were considered so damn cheesy. Put that down right now. Put it down. It's the only thing to do. I knew he was holding you back. Yeah, but we were partners. If it weren't for Luther, I'd still be hustling pinball down at Gianelli's. I don't need any more of what I got. That's weird. That was weird. Yeah, holding him back. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what we're being told is yeah. that Hooker is super talented. Yes. It, again, he's like the young star in the small ball club that needs to go to the bigs, you know? Yeah. But doesn't want to go because he's afraid of making the change because there's comfort and security here. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then as they're chatting about all this and what's going to happen in the future, this car comes flying out Oof. and there is Charles Durning <laughs> who chases Hooker down the aisle, alley. And it's obvious, A, this is a cop, and it's obvious that they that they know each other. Oh, hi there, Snyder. 
What's the matter? Things a little slow down at the bunko department tonight, huh? And Snyder already knows about this big score. You tied into a loaded mark on 47th across the maxis. If he hadn't been a numbers runner for Doyle Lonigan, it would have been perfect. So now this is the first that Hook, not only is Hooker finding out yeah. what we've already learned, that who he stole money from, but it's all over town. Because yeah. if Snyder knows, everybody knows. Now I figure you're under the score was at least three Gs. I want two, no matter what it was. And he stands up and he goes, all right. And he reaches into his wallet and he pulls out a big stack of money and hands it to Snyder. And I love that Kid Erie is watching this because Hooker told Luther, I blew the three grand. Yeah. And now he's pulling out three grand. I thought you blew all your money. I did. Stuff I gave him is counterfeit. They'll spot it the first place he tries to spend it. Are you crazy giving him counterfeit money? He just takes off out of the blue, leaving the Erie kid to fall, yeah. uh, run behind him. Yeah. Well, and again, so first of all, this is an important plant that we're setting up that he shouldn't have given counterfeit money to this cop because yes. this cop's going to be after him for the rest of the movie. Yeah. And then also because now he knows that Lonigan is after him, he yeah. knows Lonigan might also be after Luther. Yeah. And he immediately runs into a store, yanks this woman out of payphone booth. I didn't know. So yeah. roughly, this older lady. Yeah. yeah. And then he's the phone is ringing and there's no answer at Luther's. Mm. Runs out. I love, by the way, that he yanked the woman out of the phone booth, but he's already gone. So she attacks Kid Erie <laughs> after he's gone. <laughs> they never attack the lead. They always attack the character actor. That's how it works. Uh, Redford's just too beautiful to beat up. That's what I'm saying. So we get back to Luther's building. And the moment we walk in through the door, we know that something's wrong Yeah, because oh. there's this guy on the phone. He's describing something. He's giving an address and a location and we're going, Oh shit. Yeah. And the shots as he bursts into that apartment where we just were and the apartment was so happy and so joyful. And now we're there and it's just obvious that someone's broken in. And in particular, the camera zooms over to that open window and the blowing curtains and we look down and we see Luther's body. Oh, yeah, and, and it's, and I think that's what explains his sudden turn and run is because, and we don't see it, right? A close up of his face and him saying Luther. He just immediately starts running because he knows if they found me, they're going to find him. And because I'm white and he's black, they're going to do worse to him. And yeah. he runs, right? To try yeah. and stop that from happening. That's what I take from that. You know? No, I'm a hundred percent. That's what it is. And mm -hmm. Alva's there and screaming and it's so sad. And I, and again, the movie did such a good job making you feel like this was his family. Yeah. You know, and yeah. seeing this moment. And of course he's the next one under threat. And the kid kind of drags him away as the cops show up and he runs off climbing fences. And then we cut to our next title card, which says the setup. And Hooker appears at this merry-go-round, which, by the way, this is shot at the Santa Monica Pier. Oh, yeah. Um, and he sees this woman sweeping on the stairs, and there is Eileen Brennan. Yeah, the great Eileen Brennan, Private Benjamin. Come on, people. What, what, what do you want from me? This is a lifelong actress, a lot of notable roles, including The Last Picture Show, a film we did recently, Steve, what, a few weeks ago. And of course, a lot of you who love <laughs> two years ago, oh, really? two years ago, sorry, two years. Yeah. That's what I meant to say a few years ago, not weeks ago. Um, uh, and also, of course, for those of you who love Clue, I, uh, I am not one of them, but I know there's a lot of you 80s people who love Clue. She is Mrs. Peacock in that as well. So um, and popped up in Jeepers Creepers. So this is a woman who has worked quite a lot. But Private Benjamin is the role that kind of exploded Eileen Brennan as an actress and playing the sadistic drill sergeant to poor Goldie Hawn's private there. <laughs> Uh, in that movie. I don't, do you remember that movie, Steve? I mean, is that what totally. you watched when you were a kid and what happened? I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen it in 20 years, but I probably watched it 10 <laughs> times back in the day. Oh, back was, in the day. I'm sure it was in the rotation, you right know, on. with all those things. I'm looking for a guy named Henry Gondorf. You know him? No. You sure? Read it. And then he says, which is what he should have said at the beginning. Luther Coleman sent me. Are you hooking? Yeah. Why didn't you say so? We walk through the space. The location is fantastic. Yeah, so good. I mean, the weirdness of a of a, a carnival inside uh, as a as a front for a brothel. It's all yeah. so weird, man. Hey, we come into this room. We hear snoring. We look at the bed. There's no one on the bed. <laughs> and then he finds Henry uh, Gondorf, Paul Newman, passed out under the bed, and says, 
the great Henry Gondor. <laughs> so how did Newman get cast in this film? So like I said, this was the supporting role. It was this heavyweight, mm. over-the-hill, drunk guy that was going to help out the main character, which is Johnny Hooker. Yeah. So when they did Butch and Sundance, George Roy Hill rented a house from Paul Newman in oh. Beverly Hills. So a few years later, he calls up Newman and says, hey, is that house available again? And Newman mm. says, yeah, sure, why? He says, oh, I'm doing a picture with Redford. And Newman goes, oh? <laughs> Anything in it for me? And it had never occurred to George Roy Hill because this was the heavy set, you know, supporting yeah. character. This yeah. wasn't a Paul Newman role. Yeah. And he, what he says is immediately dollar signs started rotating around <laughs> in his head. And he said, yeah, maybe there's a second part. Yeah. So he sends him the script. He reads the script and says, I'm dead wrong for this part. You know, this right. character for someone who's way more long in the tooth and it has been. And, you know, that's not me. And Redford hears about this and they're all kind of together. And, and here's how Newman describes it is they were at some event and he's with George Roy Hill mm. and Redford and Redford went up in the elevator and then the elevator went to the wrong floor that left or something that left George Roy Hill yeah. and Newman sitting on the platform waiting for the elevator. And Hill says, I think you're, and Newman would not say what expletive he used, <laughs> but let's say just like, I think you're fucking crazy yeah. if you don't do this film. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just the extra one minute of the elevator having to go away and come back and for George Roy Hill to insult him to make Newman go, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. And Newman hadn't had, since Sundance, he had not had a good run. Yeah. He had no, like, yeah, yeah. It was like Judge Roy Bean and like there were some other movies that didn't do very well. Yeah. Um, and so he, he kind of needed something and the pairing with Redford had gone so well in Butch and Sundance is like, okay. Plus, both he and Redford made a half million bucks each on the movie, and Newman got a percentage of the movie. I don't know if Redford Oof. got a percentage of the movie. Yeah, we're about the everyone right now is raging about, well, not everyone, but a lot of people are raging about Robert Downey Jr. getting paid $100 million to come back to play Doctor Doom in the MCU over a couple of films. Um, but here is Robert Redford and Paul Newman making this much money uh, and I think Brando had just made this much money himself. So Brando had set the bar for the price. And so Newman and Redford were able to negotiate for that separately. Cut to the shower pelting down on Paul Newman. Turn it off. You sober? Turn it off, will you? I love how willing Paul Newman is to let himself be in this role, you know? I have to believe with Butch Cassidy in this movie, Again, like he is very nervous about doing comedy. He does not think he's a funny guy and doesn't work for comedies. And George Roy told, told him in Butch on Sunday, it's like, just play it straight. The comedy will be around you. Just play it straight. Right. And this, and I think there's a fearlessness with him when it comes to this comedy, this kind of comedy stuff or comic beats. And I think it's because he's not sure that he can do it or he's not fully confident that he can do it. So he's willing to like put himself in certain positions in order to uh, accentuate the comedy or underline the comedy. So it works that he's just sitting there and calmly getting water splashed on it. Cause we've seen shower hit number of people in movies, Steve, and it's always the big reaction. Oh, oh, you know, that kind of stuff. And he's so calm about it all uh, as, uh, as um, uh, Johnny is looking at him and, and dissecting him already and uh, thinking he's coming up short in his mind. You know? Well, since you, since you brought, I was going to bring this up later, but I think oh. this is a perfect time of okay. talking about going for the comedy mm. and that, so this is something that Paul Newman said about George Roy Hill is that he said he was very autocratic. He had his military background and what he said goes, but yeah. he was totally willing to watch any crazy idea that the actors had. Oh, and here's what Newman said. And I love this. And I think you will too about mm. acting. He says, sometimes you need to play the totally outrageous thing and it was wrong and it would be wrong and completely wrong. But that outrageous choice leads you in the complete opposite direction, which is actually the right choice. Mm, yeah. You say you had to, you got to be able to go for it. Sounds about right to me. Yeah. And that it sounds like is that George Roy Hill totally let them really go for it. Yeah. But then once they decided what was the right choice, then that was the right choice. And he, and that, and to me, that's what directing is, is yeah. like, 
I want to give my actors tons and tons of freedom. In the end, the buck's got to stop with the director at a certain point. Right. You want me to walk across the stage and die in the middle of the stage? <laughs> well, the people on the left of the house can't see you. They can't see you. I, I, I'm not going to, you know what? Not this told story. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a Tootsie reference. Yes, it was. Sorry. Glad to meet you, kid. You're a real horse's ass. Luther said I could learn something from you. I already know how to drink. <laughs> What's so crazy, to, and this is this is what I mean by this is what acting is. Yeah. Think about Butch and Sundance. Right. Their relationship. It was all exactly right. They understood each other perfectly. You knew exactly who these people were in relationship to each other. Yeah. And this is a completely different relationship. Totally different. Yeah, if you were to put it in the world of Butch and Sundance, say, say uh, uh, Butch had survived, which a lot of people think he did. Um, this is like the uh, Sundance's kid coming up to try to learn from him as yeah. he's the older grizzled veteran. You know, That's the energy that's going on. Sorry about Luther. The best street worker I ever saw. He had you down as a big timer. What happened? A condo senator from Florida on a stock deal. Real lobby. I thought he was going to take over General Electric. Some shantuzzi woke him, though, and he put the feds on me. What's great about this is it, A, explains why is Gondorf living at a brothel slash merry-go-round and a drunk who's under his bed. It explains that. Yeah. But it's also a plant because this is what we're going to use for the FBI guys later on is yeah. that Gondorf is on the run from something that happened in Florida. Oh yeah, you know exactly. Uh, yeah. That's smart, smart screenwriting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Redford's response. I mean, you blew it. Luther didn't tell me you had a big mouth. You didn't tell me you was a screw up either. <laughs> like this is not Butch and Sundance. Yeah. And then this is another key question. Yeah. Did Lonigan after you too? I don't know. I ain't seen anybody. You never do, kid. It's interesting, by the way, that. In both movies, he calls him kid. Yeah, that's true. Right. Something but it doesn't good. mean the same thing. Yeah. And it's also this plant of how much is Hooker sharing with Gondorf mm -hmm. about how much trouble he is in is the secret sauce of the whole movie. Mm -hmm. That's what's, that's that idea, that niggling little doubt that we're going to build over time is what elevates this from a really good caper movie into one of the great movies. Yeah, agreed. I think. Agreed. You know, and in a way, this is like, this is what makes it not Ocean's Eleven. I, I, and I love Ocean's mm. Eleven. Mm. But Ocean's Eleven doesn't have that extra kind of layer, I think, of this, that this has in it's terms good. of the it's, trust. Yeah, it's, it's fun and it's flashy. Exactly. But it doesn't have the, and uh, I think the third one is the only one that really carries a little weight because Pacino is in, is a scary antagonist, and Elliot Gould almost dies from a heart attack in the opening right. scenes of that movie. So there are stakes in that movie. The first one is much more flash and style, and we're cool, and right. we're trying to get Julia Roberts back. You know? Yep. Back at the merry-go-round, Henry is now in his overalls. Would you mind opening the round a little early today? We got some business coming in before ours. Sure. And check the main gearing, will you? Man of War started rattling yesterday and threw a kid on its head. And I love. It's you mentioned that this is a brothel, yeah. but it's all handled so subtly. Like we yeah. never, like it, you kind of go like, what business? What is this going on here? It's just really in the background. And that's why you cast someone like Eileen Brennan, who can play it very chill, but you know it's still just kind of lurking there under the surface. Listen, Gondorf, am I going to learn to play the big con or not? What's your hurry? I want to play for Lonigan. You know anything about the guy? Yeah, he croaked Luther. Anything else I got to know? I think Redford does a great job playing the impetuous, angry, impatient kid. Yeah, it's a change from, well, no, actually it isn't because at the end of Bush Cassidy and Sundance or the latter half of the movie, he becomes the angry, impetuous, frustrated kid, right? It's Butch who has to talk him down, but talking him down from a place of love. Whereas here in the film, because they've just barely met each other, he's, he's trying to guide him through this whole situation from a place of like, look, I'm the oldest guy in the room. I'm the most experienced guy in the room. I'm trying to guide you through this. Shut up and listen. That kind of is a different energy there, right? Well, and I think he's also trying to gauge him. He's yeah, going right. like, well, who That's is true. this guy? Yeah, what's going on? Great point. We ask about, you know, who Lonigan is. He runs a numbers racket on the south side. He owns a packing house, a few banks. Yeah, and half the politicians in New York and Chicago 
I'm not fixing this world gonna cool him out if he blows on you. I'd get him anyway. Why? Because I don't know enough about killing to kill him. It's a great line from Redford. And this is where we get into this idea of there's this special breed of people that are the big con people. Yeah. Can't do it alone, you know. It takes a mob of guys like you and enough money to make them look good. I know plenty of guys. It's not like playing winos in the street. You can't outrun them. I never played for no winos. You gotta keep his con even after you take his money. He can't know you took him. You're scared of him. Right down to my socks, Buster. And then there's this look, and this only happens with actors that have just great chemistry together. Yeah. Because Redford looks at him and goes, You're going to go for him. And that slow smile on Paul Newman's face. (laughs) This is why it's not some supporting actor. Yeah. Because only Newman can do that. Just don't want a hothead looking to get even coming back halfway through saying it ain't enough because it's all we're going to get. People are inspired by by the great challenge. And clearly, yeah. he's been waiting, right? Just like the Joker's face wakes up in that asylum when Bruce returns and Dark Knight returns. That's basically what you're witnessing here. Here's a question from Maria Torres, one of our advisory hey. board members, Love who Maria. says, the, in their first outing together, as you both discussed, Newman and Redford were pretty much equal footing. Here in The Sting, the balance seems to have tilted a little more in making Redford's Hooker the main focus. Mm. Hooker and Gondorf have to earn each other's trust in a way we never experienced for Butch and Sundance. I personally love the sting just a little bit more than Butch Cassidy and the Sundance oh. Kid. But your discussion about balance made me start to wonder how you feel about this slight weighting of the story towards Redford's character. He is, I put it in professional wrestling terms uh, mm. because it all connects, whether you like it to or not, it all connects. This is the older wrestler putting over the younger wrestler who is about to come into his prime. And that's what this is. Redford, oh, I mean, sorry, Newman doesn't show up until 26 minutes into the movie. And the rest of the time, he is guiding the young kid through, well, young kid, relative, through this next level of status. And in essence, Paul Newman, as the older actor, is making way for the younger Robert Redford to now step into his prime in the 1970s and be the big thing. You know, Robert Shaw said that, uh, and George Roy Hill said this too, like traveling with these two, or going to the locations with these two guys was like traveling with the Beatles. Like women right. were showing up all the time to scream for them. Robert Shaw said it was frustrating at times uh, because the women would line up at these location shoots and would scream for Robert and Paul. And then Robert really started to become the person they screamed at for the most. And so you see that here. So to me, I th- that's what I liken it to is that this is Paul Newman, who want, who was on a, as you said, Steve, on a bad run. It's a po- here's a possibility to work with a guy who maybe directed his last greatest film, which is Butch Cassidy, and his buddy, who he, who he delivered a great performance with. And so let's go recapture a little bit of the magic. And uh, I'll happily play the smaller role and the less screen time role, but the role that also carries a lot of weight in the scenes that he's in, guiding the young kid to where he needs to go. So... To me, that's the way I look at it. So in, there's this question that gets asked a lot in script development, which is, who is the story about? Mm. And there's this theory in Hollywood movies that, in general, a movie is about one person's journey. Right. And there are all sorts of movies where that's not true, and that's why I tend to always push back against these kinds of rules. Yeah. But it's frequently a good question to ask, because sometimes you're a little bit lost when you're writing or developing a project, and you got to go like, well, who is the story about? Right. There is no question The Sting is about Robert Redford's character. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of Hollywood structure, is that beginning, middle, and end, he has a complete journey. It's he, The motivation is his desire re, for revenge for Luther. His uh, evolution is from a person who is the young up-and-comer who's rough around the edges, who learns how to r- run the big con, right. and at the end is, a, you know, achieved. That's classic Hollywood structure. And so in that sense, Redford is the star, and Newman is the supporting actor. Yeah. But, and maybe this comes from, and my guess is you were kind of the same way, is I did theater all through my childhood. I only once did I ever play the lead in anything. Yeah. I was yeah. always the person who showed up for 10 minutes and did the funny scene. I was always the uncle. I was always the heavy. I was always, and to me, uh, it's not that I would never want to play a lead, but supporting actors are often the most fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think. Paul Newman is having a blast playing yeah, this part. Sure. He is, and he is completely a hundred percent captivated and realized every moment that he's on screen. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of I don't 
think about this balance, you know, like thing that much. It's like, if I, you know, if you get a gig and you show up for a week and it's a lot of fun, that's great. And if you have this great small part, that's great. Like I, but I'm never a movie star type. So I, you know, I get it, you know, I don't have that kind of thing, but for me, it's like, yeah, it is not even, and it is fantastic. That's how yeah, I feel. And, and as we said earlier, and we said in through Butch Cassidy and Sundance, th- these are actors, these two guys. Yeah. They're not movie stars. They're actors. They became movie stars, but they're actors at their heart. And that's Newman was. And the films he chooses to do after Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid are an actor's choice of films to do. They're not the standard glossy uh, theatrical feature lead. It is much more incisive roles that he's exploring because he's driven by that compass. He has that compass. That compass of his points north toward challenging roles to to yes, play, exactly. which will lead him to the movie we're going to do later right. in a few weeks here or in a couple of weeks. Uh, the verdict that yep. it, that is a role that a lot of actors would have turned down at that time and probably did. I haven't done the research yet on that, but like he is such a perfect choice for that role as this aging ambulance chaser with one last shot at glory. It's great. Uh, and so, you know, this is the thing that I love about Paul Newman. Um, and I think a lot of actors love about Paul Newman who who love acting, who understand the business of acting or, or they understand the craft of acting. Yeah. Paul. I, I have a totally unformed thought. Sure. But I want to throw it out. Let's do it. It occurs to me mm-hmm. that part of what makes a movie star a movie star is on some level a certain lack of vulnerability. Like there is... They are bigger than life, Mm -hmm. you know, like they're, you know, Arnold being the obvious example, but like John Wayne wasn't a movie star because he was vulnerable Mm -hmm. in the searchers. He shows his vulnerability and that is shocking. And that, whereas the actor, the, the quote unquote, like fine actor, they make their money on their vulnerability. Like De Niro is all about his vulnerability. Yeah. And it's interesting to me because I just suddenly went, Oh, in the verdict, that's where Newman embraces his vulnerability mm. fully, you know? Yeah. we. That, but we had seen, you know, shade, as you say, it's an unformed thought. So we'd seen shades of it in cool hand Luke. Yep. And like, in the hustler, I, I actually yeah. watched that over the weekend again, cool hand Luke on, on uh, Pluto. And yes, uh, uh, the hustler, Steve very well pointed out. Um, uh, what's a sweet bird of youth with Patricia yeah. Neal HUD has. So he's always been drawn to these characters that have, these flaws and vulnerabilities to them, whether he leans into them depends on the material, but that's always been something that Paul Newman has been attracted to. Even here, Steve, he's a guy who is, who flew too close to the sun and now is trying to get back on top again. So he's got his own vulnerabilities. The fact that he has to take a moment to breathe before he walks in and does his role uh, at the card game speaks volumes to the fact that he, is not 100% confident that his mojo can still work, you know? Right, right. So uh, we've decided we're going to go after them, and we have this great music. And here's just Mm. a little directing tip, because all I'm sure that was in the script was Hooker gets gussied up. He gets the manicure. He gets the new suit. He gets all that stuff. That's, That's what has to happen. But what happens in the scene is that you see Redford resist the manicure yeah. and then embrace the manicure and then sort of smile flirtingly at the people working on him. And of course, Redford is so good looking and like, it's amazing how good he looks at the end of the scene. But like, that is the difference between a passable movie and a good movie mm. is yeah, you do have to get out that he, he gets the nice outfit and the manicure and the haircut, but what's, but making that scene exciting is what Redford does in that chair. Yeah. Agreed. 100% agreed. He gets uh, a key to the room, and for the first time we see Ray Walston, uh, hey. who's one of my favorite actors, and Harold Gould playing Kid Twist, dressed in the most ridiculously <laughs> elegant uh, outfits, and they do the classic, the Sting nose flick, yeah, which all of us were doing forever after this movie came out. <laughs> of course, Ray Walston, Mr. Hand from Fast Times Ridgemont High, but also for those of you who are really older than us, my favorite Martian uh, and what have you. So a fantastic character actor. And I'll say this, Harold Gould is a guy I loved every yeah. time I saw him pop up and stuff. I thought for years that he was Elliot Gould's older brother <laughs> uh, or uncle possibly, but no, no connection, no relation to them. But I'll tell you one bit of trivia with Harold Gould. He was the original Mr. Cunningham and oh, he really turned down the role to go do a play 
And it was Tom Bosley uh, who got hired to replace him. But he was the original wow. Mr. Cunningham. He was going to be in Happy Days with Marion Ross. So that yeah. is it's an interesting little uh, tidbit for him. But uh, both of them, uh, there are so many great master actors throughout this entire film yeah. who are character actors. And certainly um, Harold Gould is one of them, Steve. I, lo- I love the moment where uh, we walk in on a bank teller who just <laughs> sees Newman for a second. It's like, yeah. all right, I'm closing up my thing. I'm out. That's all. And we're done. <laughs> Time to go, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Redford leaves his room. He puts a little piece of paper in the door that's going to come up later. Uh, and we're back with our guys in this meeting. And we're starting to hear some of the exposition about Lonigan. And basically, they run down all of his business. And they're looking for somewhere that they can take advantage of. And it's really tough to find. He owns most of the stock he's traded, but my guess is he's just trying to build himself a respectable image. He came out of Five Points, but he's been telling everybody he was born in Forest Hills. So what does Five Points make you think of? Uh, gangs in New York. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. So if Lonigan is 60, mm. and this is 1936, mm. then he was born in 1876, 10 years after the events of Gangs of New York. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy to think about, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So his his dad could be Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. That's, or, that's or his John generation. C. Riley, right? Yeah. He's the Irish. Yeah. That's his, that's his uh, timeline. We also hear the name of his favorite assassins, which is Riley and Cole, which mm-hmm. we know because we already heard their names. Those are the people that are going after Redford. Yeah. And we show Hooker the pictures of the guys that are after him. Right. And what you see is there's a rack focus to Paul Newman watching Redford as he looks at the pictures. Mm. And all of these things are these little tiny details of can Gondorf trust Johnny Hooker? You see anything, kid, you let us know. If they put you on the spot, we got to fold a con. So again, this is like the details of like, therefore, because he says we're going to fold the con if anyone's coming after you, Johnny Hooker can't tell him that anyone's coming after him right. because that would interfere with his revenge on Luther. Yeah. And they're subtle, but all these little motivations are in there. Little plants. Yeah. And then we're out at the bar with Billy and in comes Snyder. Looking for a guy on the land from a counterfeiting rap. I thought he might have come in here. I don't think so. I know everyone in the place and I always bounce the lamps just. All right, if I look around in here? No, but you're welcome to a free beer before you go. <laughs> She hands him a beer and he pours the beer out right on his hand, on her hand. Which was a mistake. Yep. Yeah. It's she it, played it off so well. Yeah. She's such a she's so good. Yeah. I don't know what to do with this guy, Henry. He's an Irishman who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, and doesn't chase names. Who that crap? He won't touch him. The croupier at Gilman says he never plays anything he can't win. So they're trying to find a con that that works for this guy. Yeah. Jeez. Does he do anything where he's not alone? Just poker. And he cheats. And as soon as he says he cheats, the <laughs> smile goes around the room. Yeah. And this is our way in. Yeah. Back with Snyder, he's about to look into the rooms. But I wouldn't go in there if I were you. What are you going to do? Call the cops? I don't have to. You'll be busting in on the chief of police just up the hall. <laughs> and that's it for Snyder. Yeah. <laughs> he's gone. Yeah. Billy walks into the meeting with the beers. They're still continuing to talk about uh, how they're going to con Lonigan. And as they're talking about this, and it, like all good movies, we're doing multiple things at once because Billy whispers in Gondorf's ear, and we know that she's telling him about Snyder, which we know Snyder is off after Johnny Hooker. We yeah. know that that's what's going on. Right. And now is when they come up with, with the plan. We'll use a wire. I've been on a poker player yet. Didn't want to beat the pony. The wire's been out of date for 10 years. That's why he won't know it. I'm not sure I know. Which I love is that normally you would explain it. Yeah. Like if someone said, hey, I don't know what the plan is. They would go, oh, well, the plan is that we do this thing where we have the, the horse races and blah, 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 yeah. blah. But they're not going to tell us because we don't need to know. <laughs> we want to keep the audience in the dark. It's going to take two of us working the inside. Any objections to Hooker as second man? And everyone's fine with that. Mm. And Redford has this great smile that he's being not only embraced into the group of the big con, but also going to be the partner, the second man. Yeah. Oh, by the way, have you guys been passing bad money lately? Robert Redford's reaction yeah. <laughs> is the perfect, what, huh? Did someone do that? It's perfect. <laughs> Who, me? And again, these are the little tiny seeds of distrust yeah. that we're creating, and they're small. 
And after this moment of distrust, once again, we get that great music. We get one of these title cards that says the hook. And with each one of these title cards, there's a little bit of visual information. In this case, it's the image of a train where one of the most exciting sequences in the film is going to happen. <laughs> and, and just speaking of the music, one of the interesting things that Marvin Hamlish said mm. is that he spent a lot of time trying to figure out what piano to play this on. Oh, is that he wanted to get a very specific sound that wasn't the fully rounded beautiful perfect sound of the giant grand piano he <laughs> wanted something that had that tone of another era that had the softness of the keys and i just i love that attention to detail because the attention yeah. to details where great films are made well that's where a great musician is essential to have in moments like this because they know you as a filmmaker steve i'm sure you've had conversations with composers like you want to you explain to them what the film is and then they will come up with the idea of what the sound may be you both agree on the sound and then what instruments are going to be best to bring that sound to life so yeah that's great to hear that he was even that meticulous marvin was in what piano to use for this uh, i'll tell you one of the things that i love and it's going to sound counterintuitive but i really love being told that i'm wrong I really oh, do. Well, and it's be okay. well because I mean obviously I don't like being wrong. Right. I don't There's like necessarily people arguing with me. Yeah. But when I'm working with a professional whose skill level is way beyond me in a certain area, yeah. I have that's why they're there is to right. so, so so an example so uh Jimmy Levine, James L. Levine, who is my composer on The Assistance and a whole bunch of other stuff I did. Uh -huh. I've known him for 25 years. Um he he worked for Hans Zimmer and a great great composer. Yeah. I remember bringing into him Here's the piece of music, because I, I always temp score things. And I'd say, here's a piece of music for, it was for the assistance, and it was mm -hmm. a, um, it was from Run, Lola, Run. And Run, Lola, Run, great, great soundtrack, yeah, super useful. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, I completely understand why you've chosen this piece of music. And this is completely wrong. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, well, what you have right is the tempo is right. Oh. And the and even sort of the tone is right, right, but it's techno, and this shouldn't be techno. It should be jazz, and here's why. And then he sh played me something that was exactly the same tempo of what I'd picked, right? except right. it was completely different. And I listened to it, and I went, you are completely right. <laughs> you, I didn't know why. I did, I, you know, like I knew yeah. enough to pick a good tempo, but I didn't know enough. That's why you have an expert, yeah, you know? Exactly. To tell you you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So we we're in this alley, we walk down these steps, and we're hearing some dialogue about this location, and we watch uh, Harold Gould, Kid Twist, who I love in every scene in this movie, yeah. walk in, and he's looking at this space that's kind of a beat-up old space, trying to see if this is going to work. It's big enough, and it's off the street. I don't know. Kind of short notice. Uh, and one of the people they're talking to who's going to provide apparently all the supplies they need is this African-American gentleman with a fantastic voice who just, he seems like a natural character to me. Yeah, absolutely. That's Avon Long, uh, who is playing the character of Benny and Avon Long. Fantastic um, song and dance man. He danced in the Cotton Club in New York in 1934. Uh, remember that Francis Ford Coppola film that kind of touched on that with Richard Gere and Gregory Hines. Lena Horne, the great Lena Horne, credits this man with bringing her out of the chorus line to a featured spot. Wow. Imagine that. Lena Horne. Uh, he was also nominated for the 1973 Tony Award as Best Supporting or Featured Actor for the musical Don't Play Us Cheap. Uh, so an interesting gentleman who lived through some of the formative years of a lot of black entertainers who were, of course, had to deal with a lot of stuff, including racism, just to make a name so to see him pop up here in the sting i think is is a fun part of this whole um uh movie for sure when you get actors like this that give that kind of sense that they were around at that time or or performed during that time so they give that energy and that authenticity to the delivery of their uh, of their lines there steve you, you know one of the things i think about a lot is the distance between the famous person and the person who was right there yeah, that was maybe just as talented, maybe just as interesting, and for whatever reason, right. they didn't go to that next level. I mean, this guy gave Lena Horne her start. You know, yeah. I mean, this is the real dude guy. Yeah. You know, exactly. And yet, his name is pretty much lost to history, except for the annals of the cinephiles. You know? And one last uh, tidbit: he is in Trading Places. He is one of the um, butlers for. <gasps> yes, he is. Yeah, that's him. Holy <laughs> shit! It's is he? I think he's the one. Where they, they give him like a dollar. Yes. You know? Yes. 
Yeah. And he's like, oh, I'll, I'll take myself to a movie by myself. By or myself. Something. <laughs> I, at some point, I we might want to do, do Trading movie. Places. We have to, right? I love Trading Places. Yeah, well, I, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I love it. Um, <laughs> and, and then we start negotiating. Not only do we want to rent this space, but, uh, but uh, Kid Twist is asking if there's a room with a view of this place from across the way. And this guy says, only rents by the month, 250 for the tour. Last time I expect to see you down here. Never heard of the place. <laughs> and then we go through all the list of things that they need, and Benny is laying out everything. Apparently, yeah. this guy can get you anything you need. And of course, this is talking to the set warehouse and the prop house mm. when you're putting on a play. A I mean, that's exactly what you do. One hundred percent. Build a set. Yeah. And we he's saying the rates, which seem kind of steep. And at the very end, he we, we ask Benny, you just give us what you can. We'll send a truck down. Now, how do you want to work this? Flat rate or percentage? Who's to mark? Doyle Lonergan. <laughs> There's this look. And then he says, Flat rate. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you guys don't live, basically. <laughs> but, you know, this is, I think, how it used to be back then. Is that, or I mean, probably up until very recently. And, and maybe there are still places that a guy, a person comes in uh, and looks at your office and, you tell them what he, what you need, and then that person goes and gets it out of their warehouse yep. because they have that thing. But I remember being in numerous uh, uh, businesses through my years where uh, we walk into a completely empty room or, or area, and you see them talking with the person who's going to bring in the desk and bring the computers and what day to expect, expect this stuff. So, yeah. It's cool. By the way, one of the ways to tell the difference between the people who been around a lot of these businesses and the people who just got startup money yeah. is whether or not you buy new furniture. Oh yes. <laughs> the people with the big startup money, they're like, yeah, we'll get all the new Herman yeah. Miller chairs and the fancy desks. We'll spend it. And the other is like, what company just went out of business? <laughs> That's where I'm going to get my stuff. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we were at the train station. And while most of the film was shot in Los Angeles and a lot on the universal backlot, this is actually union station in Chicago. Oh, nice. And we see Doyle Lonigan come in, and he walks by Redford and Newman, her watching him. He's not as tough as he thinks. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Oh, and also, Steve, if you notice, Robert Shaw is limping as he yes. walks by uh, Redford and Newman in this scene. And that is actually his limp. Like, he injured his knee and incorporated the limp into the performance According to one of the great books that I read as a young guy exploring Hollywood, You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again by the producer Julia Phillips, she said that Shaw split all the ligaments in his knee after slipping on a wet handball court at the Beverly Hills Hotel a week before filming started. He had to wear a leg brace during production, which was kept hidden under his trousers, his 1930s style trousers, the whole time that he was shooting this film. So that's an authentic limp. From Robert Shaw as he's going by. That's not some character choice, you know. Can, can I add one more detail to sure, your story? Sure, sure. So we're in the midst of rehearsal when this happens. And Robert Shaw walks, limps into rehearsal, goes to George Roy Hill and says, I'm so very, very sorry. Of course, you'll have to recast me. You know, and I, and I completely understand. I messed up. I'm really, really sorry. Right. And George Roy Hill looks at him and he goes, walk over to the other side of the room. And then he says, he does, and he goes, okay, walk back to me. And Robert Shaw limps back towards George Roy Hill, who yeah. watches him, and he goes, use it. <laughs> use it. Yeah. And the thing is, that's, but so, I, I love every, I mean, I don't love the element of the story where Robert Shaw got hurt, right. but I love the element where he was willing to give up the part. Yeah. And that George Roy Hill looked at him and went, no, th this is something I've talked about directing and, and, and been thinking about forever is the idea mm. of I have the movie perfectly imagined in my head. Yeah. And as opposed to shit's going to happen, the shark's not going to work with Jaws, Brando's going to show up 40 pounds overweight, and then you go and then you reimagine the movie. Yeah. And that the movie that gets reimagined based on this weird thing that happened is better. Yeah. Lonigan's limp is huge. It's amazing in the movie. Yeah, I have a theory that the great creatives are people who, when they leave the house, don't want to go back to the house because they forgot something. Hmm. They're the people who <laughs> Wait, were explain, Okay, cheating. explain this theory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I've had this theory for a while. And I think it, it speaks volumes to being able to troubleshoot whatever situation that you're in and want to go forward and finish the job. I think the great directors 
don't want to delay, don't want to take no for an answer, don't want to wait around for something to be available. They want to go forward. Once they start the process, they want to go forward and complete the task before heading back uh, at to the end of the film, right? And so for me, that's what I think. I think there are certain people who are built that when they leave the house and they get far enough away from the house that it would be an actual chore to go back and get the thing they forgot, they don't go back and get it and they stay on the road and just kind of troubleshoot the situation as best they can and to accomplish the goals that they set out to accomplish that day. Now, if they're supposed to return something to the Amazon UPS store, that's a different conversation. But I think <laughs> I think there are people who are built this way that once they leave the house, they hate to double back and go back to the house and grab whatever they forgot because they took them all that energy just to leave the house. So I feel that way about great creatives. I, I love this theory. I really do. And, and well, in particular, because it, it, it kind of describes me in some ways of like, I, I move you on, know, you know, like, yeah. I'm just like, you know, I don't, I, I don't spend a lot of time crying over spilled milk. I spend yeah. a lot. I'm like, I want, I, it, it's not that I'm not a perfectionist in lots of ways. Obviously yeah. you've witnessed that sometimes to your irritation, I'm <laughs> sure. But I'm not a perfectionist in the sense of, well, it's just like the story I just told about music. Yeah. Of my perfect vision has to be realized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not how it's like, we're in the shit. What can we make out of this? You yeah, know, like let's, yeah. and then, and let's bust our ass and do it. Not worry about all the other stuff, you know? Well, and I think Robert Shaw is a man's man. George Roy Hill was a man's man and not yep. to get into any kind of sexist, toxic masculinity or anything, but men's men. And so he's like, can you walk? Can you? Fine. Use it. We'll make it work. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Let's go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and it also goes to, I didn't hire you for your legs, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Like I hired you for your acting. And it could add a little element of danger because then it lets the audience go like, when did he get that injury? I, that's what I think. Those kinds of things come into your mind as you watch that. Yeah. Strangely enough, oh. in, in the hands of Robert Shaw, yeah. I think his limp makes him more powerful and scarier. I agree. Yeah. I agree. He's like a wounded animal in the corner. Yeah. yeah. He seems more dangerous. Yeah. So- What's about to happen in this film is that we're going to cut back and forth between a bunch of the setup yeah. for the big con in setting up the space, getting all the people, all that organization. And most of that's going to be with Kid Twist with the con of Lonigan and the poker game with Redford and Newman. Yeah. And this is going to cut back and forth. But for the sake of the podcast, I think we're going to actually handle them separately because I think it'll be fun to see that poker game as a whole. Yeah. And so let's talk about the setup first, and then we're going to go back on the train and we're going to talk about that poker game. Okay. Okay. So we see this bar and in comes Kid Twist looking elegant as always. And the charisma coming off of Harold Gould as he greets everyone in this bar is yeah. just amazing. Yeah. And he walks into the office and obviously everyone knows him here. And the first thing they talk about is Luther Coleman. And apparently it just seems like everybody knew Luther and everyone loved this guy. Yeah, some of the boys were passing the half Alvin and the kids. You know, I've never seen a guy so worked up. Well, don't worry about it, Dookie. We're gonna send a little calling card of our own. Gundorf is setting up a wire store on the north side. I'm gonna need a 20-man boost right away. And I love, I love what they're implying, which is that there's this like a union of underworld con men. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that everybody, I love some of the words they use in the show where it's like the boy, these boys got to be quill. And I've yeah. never heard the term quill anywhere <laughs> else used, but apparently according to David S Ward, this is a real, you know, word that he used for people being excellent. And we say, give me the sheet. So not only is there a union of con men, right. But they have a list of the people with all their skills and yeah. stuff. Yeah. To use for certain jobs. Yeah. yeah. Why not? You yeah, have to do it. There's no computer database, Steve. It has to be all on a list. I guess so. Yeah. And so they go out to get the sheet, and just as this happened, we're out in the bar, and we see uh, the entrance, and we just see some legs come in. And as soon as you see the legs, you know that it's Charles Durning. This is fantastic filmmaking, right? George Roy Hill, when he shoots Kid Twist coming in, when he shoots Kid Twist, it's from the side, and we see him full body as he comes in, right? And it's smoky. And he's working his way through him. And by the way, Kid Twist, if I think this guy is a dangerous dude, but he's he's a very nice guy and everybody loves him, right? The way he works yeah. that room, walking through everybody. A guy coming in in a top hat with a silver top on his cane and the trench coat normally would get his ass kicked in Chicago, I think, in the 1930s. But in this clear, bar, yeah. Clearly, Kid Twist is a guy who has a reputation for either getting stuff done 
or taking care of business himself if people mess with him, right? So the way that he works, he glad hands that entire bar. You can tell there's a real level of respect for this guy when he comes to the door. The fact that George Roy Hill shoots um, Charles Durning, well, we don't even see his face, mm. and it's from the other side, It's and it's a much more ominous entrance. I think it's these little subconscious things that great filmmakers do to put you in the frame of mind before you even see the character that's about to kind of intim- try to intimidate people in the bar. So it's really smart. He keeps us away from Kid Twist, and he keeps us close up on the violence of uh, Charles Durning. I got such a good point, and I really do think this movie and and, but, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yeah. Kid, you can just study for where the camera is. You know, 100%. where's the camera? What lens are we on? It's always a choice. It's mm-hmm. never like I am not a great camera person, and I'm my first instinct is straight on master shot over the shoulder, over the shoulder, a couple of close ups and a few inserts, and I cover the scene because I think like an editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so then I get all my footage and I can edit together however I want. But that's not what great filmmaking is, really. Yeah. And 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 you can really see it in this. Yeah. Um, the other thing, which I hadn't thought about until you just said it about Kid Twist, my guess is it, it is true that that Johnny Hooker is the second man in this with Gondorf. Yeah, he is sure. the number two. Sure. Except not only is Kid Twist really the number two, but in fact, if, if Henry Gondorf wasn't here, he could be Henry Gondorf. You know, I think he's that yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, 100%. He, then there's no way this goes off without him. There's no way that he's the most essential part of the crew, this side of Redford and Newman, a hundred percent. Yeah. They look through, I love that they have the little window that they can slide open to yeah. look through at Snyder as he comes in and they recognize him as a detective. And who does he walk right up to, but kid Erie, yeah. who is doing his best to hide and not doing a very good job. Hey, you see that friend of yours lately? No, no, he, uh, Packed it in, enrolled in detective school. <laughs> <laughs> and the, of course, the whole bar loves that. Yeah, they yeah. love that he's mocking Snyder, and everybody laughs, and then Snyder kind of nicely pats Kid Erie and then slams into the table, breaking yeah. his nose. When you see him. You tell him you better pay up before I get to him. Charles yeah. Durning is a low-key great villain. Totally. Right, because he's he's not big like Brian Dennehy, but he's got a size and ferocity to him, you know. And so when he gets to play these harder edge characters, it's really chilling and and that's unsettling. And he does it so well, you know. I mean, honestly, and it's not just because they're both kind of similar builds, mm. but him and Ned Beatty have yes. the range. It's yeah. the range that impresses me because Ned Beatty can be in Deliverance network and superman yeah and charles durning can be in this and be in which you referenced in our uh, earlier in this episode yeah. of in tootsie yeah i mean like you compare his oh. character in tootsie to snyder oh. they're t- the opposite you yeah. know completely opposite or a uh, dog day afternoon oh where yeah he is uh, a put up a, a put out policeman trying to negotiate this stuff and trying to do the best to save everybody in the situation yeah yeah yeah, great actor. <laughs> I love, by the way, that as they, this just makes me happy as just a list of great names because they start talking about all the con artists available and they say, let's say Horseface Lee, Slim Miller, Suitcase Murphy, and the Big Alabama is in from New, or- New Orleans, Crying Jonesy, and the Boone Kid from Denver, D- Duffy Burke, and Limehouse Chappie from New York. <laughs> I have to believe that Scorsese did an homage to this in Goodfellas. Oh, sure. Right? When they're going through the bar and he's the voiceover of all the different names, Jimmy Two Times or whatever. Like, I think there's a little bit, you can catch little homages um, that uh, certain great filmmakers make to the great films that they've seen or the informidable times. You know? If this thing blows up, remember, I can't tell you no good downtown. Kind of is federal. Dookie, if this thing blows up, the feds will be the least of our problems. Hey, everybody's involved, man. Everybody's yep. involved. Well, and everything is everything is setting things up, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And now it's later on, and we're in the space, and there are all these guys waiting in line who are the con men who are essentially looking for a job. And our first one who comes in is Curly Jackson. Yeah, that's pay, played by uh, Tom Spratley. If you, if you are eagle-eye viewer of him in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he's the men's room attendant uh, when uh, oh Ferris God. is cleaning himself up. <laughs> but he was also... In Sudden Impact and The Hitcher, 
uh, uh, Protocol, which, of course, with the great Eileen Brennan. Max Dugan returns and the man with two brains. So a guy who didn't do a lot, but certainly popped up in a lot of these notable uh, films throughout his career. And his last appearance on anything was in Highway to Heaven, for those who remember that show in 1987. And here's another example of how great screenwriting works, which is that we've said, Gondorf has said, and then Kid Twist has implied that we need top, top con artists yeah. who really know their way around the big con to work on this job. Yeah. And we also want to include Kid Erie, and we really want to show that he isn't that, that he is not that experience, that right. he is low experience. And so, well, how, so we've said this, but how are we going to show it? And so we have this character come in before Kid Erie, who is obviously super experienced and knows how to do the big con. I can shell, mock, board, anything you want. I don't run with riffraff and I only drink on the weekend. Me specialty is an English woman. <laughs> and so it's obvious that this guy has done this many, many, many times before. Yeah. And so he's an instant hire. And he, I, I love to, and this is what makes me think about actors, is he says, you know, okay, we'll go out and pick out a nice tweed suit. And he and he says, that's all right. I've got all my own stuff. Yeah. I love that moment when he does yeah. has a suitcase. Yeah. And you know, in his suitcase is it's like an actor. He's got yeah. his makeup. He's got all the things that he needs. Yeah. If you get a gig. Yeah. And in contrast, the next person that comes into the office is Kid Erie. And he comes in. He's hiding his nose that just got broken by yeah. Snyder. You uh, played for any particular mobs? No. You ever play The Wire before, Harry? No. And he's obviously embarrassed, and he says, I never played no big con before, but uh, Luther Coleman was a friend of mine, and I thought maybe there'd be something I could do. And I love the vulnerability mm. that he, he, he it just he's just putting it out there. He's like, look, yeah. I, I know I'm not used to you, but I want to help, you know? Yeah. You get that nose in Duke Boudreaux's tonight? And he takes away his hand because he knows it was stupid to hide it in the first place. Yeah. And then twist. And man, this line is a cliche, but I love it. And maybe this is where the cliche comes from, because he because twist says, You got Moxie Erie. Get yourself a suit. So this is a question I have. Uh from one of our patrons, uh at the Roca says, and he says <laughs> question. Where is why is Kid Erie kind of on the fringes of all of this? Why is he not in conversation? Uh, with Redford it, about all of this. Well, is this all a setup? Like, why at this point are you thinking, like, why isn't Johnny Hooker helping him out? They were walking together when he ran off to go check on Luther. Luther's clearly part. They were all in on this uh, opening uh, uh, con. So, why wouldn't Johnny Hooker be talking to Kid Eri about this whole situation? Why does he have to lobby to be part of the con? It seems odd, doesn't it? Well, uh, patron at the Roca says, <laughs> I, I'm going to give you two answers. Yeah. And the answer, the first answer, which is the most important, is that Robert Redford is a movie star, and this guy is not. <laughs> oh, excuse me. But that's oh. my first answer. But my second answer is I think there's an implication. Yeah. It's, it's, it, there's a status thing going on, and it seems very clear that everybody understands their status, yeah. which is that Johnny Hooker is the heir apparent, the golden boy the up-and-coming con artist, and everybody recognized it, yeah. particularly Luther. Fair point. And Kid Erie is is a working guy, yeah. you know, and knows it. You mm -hmm. know, like, I, he, he knows he could never be a bit, he could never be a Henry Gondorf, he could never be a Luther, he could never be a Johnny Hooker. Right. He can be the guy that plays the guy with the knife and then runs away. That's what he could do. Okay. That's my feeling. What? Let me ask this. So, uh, John, we got this question from our patron at the Roca says. Oh my! What? What? What do you think of? What do you think the reason for this is? Where does he get the money to patronize his show? For God's sake! Oh. <laughs> yes, great point. <laughs> no, I, I find it odd because there's the the film never explains it to you, and so um, when we're, we're I mean, they're splitting this thing three ways. So then it makes me think that this guy was a hire for the con at the opening of the film. Except that there's a familiarity with him, right? When they walk together, when they're doing all these, there's a familiarity between him and Hooker. So it seems odd to me that he would have to kind of lobby to try to be a part of this con when Luther and Hooker knows this was just important to him as it was to Hooker. So it just seems like an odd thing to all of a sudden push him to the side and have him be a part of this situation 
in so, I mean, because he gets the worst of everything, right? Uh, he gets beat up by Robert Redford in the opening con. Uh, then he has to experience the death of Luther. Then he gets beat up uh, by Charles Durning, and now he's having to beg for a job here to be part of this con. So, I think when the guy when um, Kid Twist tells him you got Moxie, that's kind of a, a good thing for us as the audience because we kind of like this guy. Yeah, and it's a shame that he's having to endure so much uh, in such a quick amount of time uh, in this film. Well, and in his way, and again, this is why this is a good. In, in an average screenplay, the or even a good screenplay, yeah. the main characters and main supporting characters, they get taken care of. Yes. And the small characters, well, we don't really follow their arcs that well. But Kid Erie right. has a complete arc, you know? Yes, yes. He, he has his own journey to go on. And that thing that you would always say to actors of like, no, this is Kid Erie's movie. Yeah. You know? This is I, your story. He has a total story that works. So this is what's happening while Johnny Hooker and Gondorf are on the train. Yeah. We Kid Twist is getting this whole thing set up behind the scenes. But all of his de- all of it is dependent of the con that happens on the train. Yeah. And I think this con is remarkable for so many reasons. And one of them is that part of it is that they need to con Lonigan out of the money because that's going to be the money that funds the con to con Lonigan. Right. That's the first step is we're actually just trying to get the money. Yep. But that's not all we're trying to do because we also want, because it's all about motivation is that we also want Lonigan to end up hating Henry Gondorf or who yeah. he thinks of as Shaw. Yeah. Um, and then we also need to set up a way where Lonigan is aligned with Hooker's character, who he knows as Kelly mm. in order to make this big con work. Yeah. And so it's not just we're trying to get money. There's multiple things that we're trying to achieve in the course of this sequence on the train. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're on the train. We're in Gondorf's compartment. We're with the conductor. Hey, here's a friendly poker game on this train. You know anything about it? Oh, little. Thank you, sir. This is what they made fun of in the Naked Gun movies of the bribe. Yeah. Did you get me in that game? Oh, I don't know. There's usually a waiting list. Gives him some money. I'll sure, get you first alternate, sir. Hands it more money. See what I can do. That's the way it works. Yep. So the conductor, Steve, is played by Larry D. Mann, who is a notable character actor. He was in uh, in the heat of the night playing Watkins. Um, but I think one of the things that I was surprised to discover about this guy is he is the voice of Yukon Cornelius and the abominable snow monster in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> so wow. I couldn't believe that it was the same guy. He had quite a career doing voiceover work and on-camera work. Uh, and so he's a guy that just was popped up in a lot of these TV shows, but then would show up in occasional things like that. So just really interesting uh, cat on so many levels as an actor and performer. Clearly one of those character actors you go to. And a lot of people, you know, when you need someone of uh, of his experience to be a part of it, and a lot of people uh, compare him. I can't remember the name of the actor who is in like uh, Meet John Doe and uh and mr smith goes to washington the the, the, the bigger like um yeah. meaner villain guy who has that <clears throat> who has this kind of voice yeah, this yeah kind of guy. Voice. we can't allow him to do that you know th- this uh he has that kind of energy so i'm not surprised that he worked yeah sydney green street that's it sydney green street uh and other character actors like that he was he was like that in that approach to things so i like that a lot. it's funny that you said that because you remember i said that um the idea of that came from Frank Capra for me of casting voices and faces as yeah. your supporting characters. Yeah. And obviously, you know, George Roy Hill learned that lesson. Oh, totally. Yeah. So it's a little bit later and uh, JJ Ray Ralston has come into Gondor's room and is giving a report. And the key to the report is. He usually plays with a tally ho fan or a tally ho circle. I got you one of each. He likes to cold deck low, eights or nines. Now, we as the audience have no idea what that means. No, no. But what's so great, but we know that they know what it means and that it's important. Yeah. And later on, we're going to kind of get it. Um, where uh, Floyd is opening the door for Lonigan, who's moving through the, the train car, and some woman bumps into him, <laughs> says, excuse me, and we realize that it's Billy, Eileen Brennan, yeah. and she walks by and as smooth as can be, drop the wallet. She just pickpock on the seat next to Redford, who grabs it, and it's just beautifully smooth. Yeah. By the way, it kind of reminds me of some of the things that go on in The Great Escape when they're on the train oh, yeah. and they all they all know each other but can't acknowledge each other because right. they're all escape prisoners. Yeah. And 
Redford goes into Gondor's room, says she picked him clean. We open up that wallet and he's got fifteen or twenty thousand dollars in his wallet. Yeah. Just, which we now know is like almost like three hundred thousand dollars, you know. Just casually. He's waiting for you in the card room. Let him wait. And then we see John Dorf take out a deck of cards. It is obvious what they're doing, but it's yeah. done really well, which is we're on Newman as he shuffles the cards. The camera moves down to the table. The hands go out of frame. The hands come back into frame. And of course, <laughs> now it's a it's a card guy whose name, by the way, is John Scarn, who did oh. the, the card tricks. Nice. And so now he's doing this great card manipulation where you see shuffle pull out the ace hide the ace the ace pose right on top ace is on you know like just all mm -hmm. this beautiful beautiful card manipulations and then the cards get put down and the hands go out and then they come back in and then we pan up and there's newman you know yeah really it, good stuff it, it is it is it, to me it's like obvious the trickery they're doing and they did the trick real well yeah and it's important too because so far we've we've been handed a, a gondorf who's a bit questioning of his abilities right now right so we have to have some kind of faith that he can pull this off so seeing him do all this is really cool but just just uh just to keep that fear inside of you as an audience we see him mess up the final moment with the with the deck yeah. there and and uh hooker gives him a big wide-eyed look like oh my god are you gonna be able to do this so i love that they keep that tension throughout that gondorf might not be able to pull this off you know well, the, the just tapping on the tension between Hooker and Gondorf, yeah, is you got to keep it alive throughout yes. the whole movie, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, by, by the way, I, I didn't know where to bring this up, but this seemed like as good a place as any. <laughs> okay. Is that Redford and Newman played a lot of pranks on each other in the oh. course, which I've heard that uh, Brad Pitt and George Clooney play pranks love, on each other. They love to do that. Yeah. yeah, and one of them that I heard, they both had Porsches. And so they'd be out between takes polishing their Porsches on the studio on the back lot. And then they would race their Porsches around the back lot. Oh, and at geez. one point, Paul Newman stole Redford's Porsche and hit it somewhere. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, Sherry, you check this uh, guy you out. Set. Seems like a pleasant man. A lot of cash on him. $200 suit. Expensive luggage. I'll vouch for him. Well, why isn't he here then? I'm not interested. Don't he worry. He'll be limited. here. And I'm sitting there going, thinking about this, I'm like, did this conductor get killed after this? I, I, that's a good question. Because he vouched for this guy, and it does not go well in any way. It's a good question. Back in Gondor's rooms, he's dabbing his cheeks with <laughs> little Gordon's gin. Yeah. And Redford's watching, going, what the hell are you doing? Then he's pouring some of the gin out. And, of course, how did we meet Gondor? We met him as a, a knockout drunk under his bed. And so... Right. Hooker's going worried, you know, yeah. can I trust this guy? Always drink gin with a mark, kid. He can't tell if you cut it. Uh, which, you know, by the way, whenever I have a mark, I always drink gin that I've watered down. That's just oh. that's just standard operating oh. procedure. All right. And now we're back at the game. They finally decide they're going to start without him. Gondorf is in the hall. This is, as you mentioned before, this is the actor backstage. Yeah. The moment before going on, he gets himself together. <sighs> Everything Newman does from this point forward in the movie, I adore. It's amazing. <laughs> I agree, hundred percent. It, it is because, and the thing is, he didn't just walk through that door; he burst through that door. And his first line is, "Sorry, I'm late, guys. I was taking a crap." <laughs> <laughs> you see, Lonigan look over at the conductor who just vouched for this guy. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's a great beginning. It's a great opening because just the kicking of the door. Knowing and then Lonigan being uh, wanting to start without the guy, so already he is um, behind the eight ball in Lonigan's eyes, and then just coming in and, and being so rude and brusque and talking about taking a crap and then shaking everyone's hands vigorously. You know, there's there's a whole energy that he's giving that's um, an arrogance and a not understanding the uh, I don't know the seriousness of what's going on in the room, which is great. You know, snapping the tension in half, which is fantastic. I'm sure all these guys are scared of Lonigan, you know. Oh, terrified. Yeah. Well, and I think in particular because we've been told that Lonigan's actual origins is he's from Five Points. Yes, right. But he is pretending that he's not from there. Right. And so everything Lonigan done is is trying to trying to put forth the veneer of class yeah. and classiness and elegance. And so this guy literally coming in and say, sorry, I'm late. I was taking a crap is totally lowering the entire <laughs> image of what he wants to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. 
And the first thing that Shaw does naturally, or his name is Shaw now, Gondorf does, is reach out to pay because he's got a big stack of money and they go uh mr shaw this is a gentleman's game we assume you're all good for your debts <laughs> which is a perfect plant for where this is going to go yep and now we're everyone you know lonigan takes five thousand dollars we realize this is going to be a pretty exp- i mean b- honestly if we were betting hundred dollar minimum and five thousand dollars that's an expensive bet for me you know get, poker game for me today mm-hmm. <laughs> much less than 36 <laughs> Mr. Shaw, we usually require a tie at this table. If you don't have one, we can get you one. Hey, that'd be real nice of you, Mr. Lonigan. Lonigan. Uh. <laughs> to burp at the res- at, someone corrects their pron- your pronunciation and you just burp at them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's perfect. Again, uh, uh, completely disrespecting him, but doing it in a way that is oblivious to who he is. So yeah. Lon- Lonigan is like kind of stuck in this place because. Normally, he'd probably kill this dude or get up and, oh, yeah. and attack this guy. But because he is uh, creating space that this guy might not know who he is, he is riding with this to see where it goes, you know, and maybe trying to take his money, too, obviously. Because he cheats, as we are. Yeah, of yeah. course. So uh, we're back to the game. It's a little later. We see that uh, Gondorf is wearing this very poorly tied tacky tie now <laughs> and the bets are going around and that you know there's you know these are big bets five hundred dollars three hundred dollars and then yeah. a raise and then a call and, and, and here's another screenwriting thing i would like to tell you okay if you decide to write your first screenplay my advice for you is to not put a poker game into it i my very first screenplay i went i wrote they're, now they're going to play poker right. writing a screenplay scene in a poker game is so hard because all the dialogue is dictated by what everyone's betting and so I had to, I realized like, oh, I have to know what's in everybody's hand oh, and yeah. what they've bet and where the bet is and who is calling and who is dealing because all the dialogue was dependent upon that. And oh, every time God. I changed the dialogue, I had to change the bets because it didn't fit right. <laughs> and it was just, so it's, it gets into this weird technical things you don't think about. Oof. So they all show their cards and Lonigan has two pairs and thinks he's going to win. And then Shaw lays down his three tens. And I don't know if you've heard this. John, but yeah. nobody likes a sore winner. Have you no. ever heard that expression? Yeah, yes. Nobody likes a winner, but nobody likes a sore winner even more. And Shaw, talk about, or Gondorf, talk about a sore winner. He puts down his 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 three tens, <laughs> laughing at all of them, and says, Tough luck, on hand. But that's what you get for playing with your head up your ass. <laughs> a couple more like that, we can all go to bed early. Yeah. I, I, th- yeah. I think Paul Newman yeah. is having the time of his life. Oh, yeah. Especially Paul Newman who, yeah. you know, probably loves, as you said, pulling the pranks on him in Redford. Uh, he loves busting balls. So this is just all, like, just destroying all of what, what's, how people are supposed to be acting in a situation like this. It's great. And he starts to pour himself a drink with his watered-down bottle of Gordon's gin, and Robert Shaw reaches out, grabs the bottle by the neck, oh yeah, and pulls it forcefully out of his hand. And just... Just the power in that gesture yeah. and the intensity is amazing. And then when he speaks. Name's Lonigan. Dial Lonigan. You're going to remember that, Mr. Shaw. You're going to get yourself another game. You follow? There's a, again, there's a lighting here and an angle of the camera here, right? I mean, Paul Newman, who is fully in bright white light. And then when you would get to Lonigan and what Robert Shaw is doing, He's in a darker suit, and when he reaches for that bottle, you see half of his face is covered in darkness to add more to the element of danger with this guy. And you're right. The way he grabs that bottle and takes it from him, he's essentially trying to threaten him or intimidate him in this situation. And he's probably mad because he's losing, too. There, there are all sorts of ways we talk about fine acting. We talk about charisma. We talk about their range. We talk about their ability with accents, their ability with physicality. I'm going to add another factor, which is just pure heat or intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think on that scale, there are few people who bring it harder than Robert Shaw. Between yeah. this and Jaws and a few other performances, yeah, it, it is like an inferno, a contained inferno is going yeah. on. Taking a Pelham especially, yeah. Yeah. I've never seen that film. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. God. He's intense in that film. It, I, I literally just put it, because we were just talking about it when you mentioned Ooh. Shaw before, and I went, yeah, I need to see that. And so I, it is now on my list, so I will watch it soon. Definitely. Um, again, it's later the game. We cut in, and this is a moment 
which is right on the edge of too far. We <laughs> cut back in with Gondorf sneezing into his tie. <laughs> yeah. Which is so disrespectful because Lonigan got him this tie. He's doing everything he can to get under Lonigan's skin. Every exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why I say it's like there's the con. Yes, we're conning him out of his money. And right. we're setting up this situation. But the real con is the emotional con. Yeah. The real con is he needs to hate this person he sees as Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, Shaw wins another hand. Well, that's just me. Don't worry about it, pal. <laughs> they wouldn't let you in here if you weren't a chump. Lombard will be joining you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> What's great, too, is oh. <laughs> every, it's not just that Lonigan hates this guy. Right. Everyone at the table hates him. Yeah. They hate him. Again, this is this is the moment where, I, where there's a look to the conductor, and I'm like, oh, this guy, the conductor's fucked. Like, there's a reason why he ends up not killing Hooker or Gondorf, but there's no reason yeah. not to kill this conductor. Yeah. Mr. Clayton, I think we should take a break for five minutes. Tempers seem to be running a little high. <laughs> I love the way Robert Shaw talks. <laughs> Shaw's response is, oh, come on, Linneman. <laughs> yeah. Little shot step by step. Yeah. Well, and even watch watch Robert Shaw as he's exiting the room and his smile back at Newman yeah. is equally as dangerous as his sneer, you know? Yeah. Stack me a cooler, Fry. Oh, come on, girl. We'll be in the station in another hour. The other guys are the big losers. You're still okay. Fix me a deck, please, and nines. I'll cut it in on Clayton's deal. We don't actually know what a cooler is, really, most audience members, I would think, at this moment. But we've heard that Lonigan cheats. We don't exactly understand it. And what we hear is he wants to basically, you know, knock Clayton out early. So it's just him going toe to toe with Shaw. Yeah. We're back in the game. Uh, one of the other guys has folded. And we see that it's, you know, Clayton, I guess, is dealt. He's handed Lonigan the cards to uh, cut. Lonigan cuts them. And I think in an incredibly obvious way, steals the deck, replaces it, and puts it in his lap wrapped in a napkin. Yeah, yeah. But I also think it's key that when we cut at this moment, we cut to Gondorf and he is clearly not looking. No, right, exactly. You know? yeah. So we go, oh no, are they going to get him? Like, what's going to happen? Because you're worried about this. Right. And we also should say that sitting directly behind Gondorf is Floyd. Yeah. And so Gondorf has been very aware of that and careful to literally keep his cards close to his vest throughout this whole thing because, a you know, an enemy is over his shoulder and could look at his cards. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure the train conductor has, you know, uh, been in this dance m numerous times where he knows Lonigan is cheating right next to him, and he purposely does not look in that direction, right. you know, because he doesn't look, not look at him one time, and he's doing it very obviously next to him. And, and the rest of this, it's done, the, the filmmaking is just stellar in terms of the storytelling, because, the you know, the cards are dealt. We yeah. see Gondorf look very carefully at his cards, and we see he's de been dealt three threes. Yeah. Queen and an eight. We see that Lonigan has a pair of nines. 500. Here, five. One thousandth. And I love, too, that there was even thought of, like, what were the chips, you know? Yeah. Like, how many hundreds, how many thousands blue chips? Were, like, it's always interesting the way that they're doing this. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, Clayton does fold. He's out. And we take our card. Shaw takes his two cards, getting rid of, we assume, his queen and his eight. Lonigan takes three. Um, and Gondorf looks at his cards and sees now he has four threes. An amazing hand. And, of course, we know that Lonigan has four nines and is going to win. It's going to win. Right. 500. Here, 500. And 1,000. And finally, Shaw goes, well, and I'm sorry I keep calling him Shaw or Gondorf. Sean Gondorf are the same person. Yeah. Sorry about that because he's that's his fake name versus his real name, which is even more confusing considering the other actor is also named Shaw. Robert so Shaw, I apologize yeah. for the confusion. I'm going to stick to Gondorf from this point forward. Sorry I'm assuming about that. people have seen the movie. So <laughs> Yeah. But so Gondorf says, you're 1,000. I'll raise you 2,000. He slides in his chips. Mr. Clemens, give me $10,000 more. And Lonigan puts it in. And right now we know, oh my God, Gondorf is going to lose. Yeah. And it, this has caught the interest of everyone else who yeah. was just kind of casually talking about when's the train going to arrive? What are we doing? People are now paying close attention to what's going to happen here. And finally, Gondorf calls. 
Lonigan puts down what he knows to be his winning four nines. Yeah. Big, huge smile on Floyd's face, who set this all up perfectly. And then Gondorf looks at his hand and says, Four jacks. And there's a reaction from Floyd, and the camera zooms in on those cards, revealing those jacks. And Gondorf says, You owe me 15 grand, pal. <laughs> and everyone's looking. And then Lonigan reaches into his jacket to pull out the wallet where he has 15 grand. And? can't find it <laughs> and goes oh, i must have left my wallet in my room and i, I it is such an insult to injury to and yeah. to pull out the money that you stole from someone to t- show them while you were prepared and yeah. brought money to this thing and they weren't don't hand me into that crap when you come to a game like this you bring your money how do i know you won't take a powder i mean <laughs> Lundgren yeah. lunges across the room yeah He's turned it around on him, right? Like he's said uh, when he came through the door, he was going to give his money for the chips. And the conductor was like, well, we, this is not that kind of game. We trust you to handle your debts. And here he turns it around at the end going like, how can you not have your money? Don't give me that shit, pal. Do you know? So I like that he he is. This is not just only a con for Lonnie. It's also to get as deeply as possible under his skin so he makes mistakes. And those mistakes are where they're going to get their advantage because he's such a formidable foe, you know? Well, and it's also the thing of you're playing the person. Yes. And Lonigan is a person from, from the beginning of the movie through this whole thing, everything for him is about reputation. Yeah. You know, he says, if he lets hooker get away with it, then anyone will come after. He's going to have to kill everybody. He's come out of five points pretending he's from forest Hills or whatever. Yeah. Like all of these things is done to create a certain reputation, a certain sense of style. And now this is threatening his reputation. It is embarrassing him in front of these other businessmen. Yeah. He's like, this is like laser focused at his core ego stuff. Yep, exactly. No, 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 not All right, I'll not. tell you what I'll do. I'll send a boy around to your room in five minutes. You better have the money or it's gonna be all around Chicago that you're welched. You won't be able to get a game of jacks. And the reaction, by the way, from Floyd, the henchman at the end of the scene of just like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. He's fantastic. You know why? Because he's got to deal with his angry boss and he hates dealing with his boss already. Dealing with his boss when he's in a mood. Ugh. <laughs> so uh, Gondorf walks back down the corridor, <laughs> smiling, goes into his room and <laughs> turns to Hooker and goes, you're on, kid. Well, I can tell you, it's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Uh, I think Newman was talking about himself in a many way. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then Redford has out and we're back with Doyle and Floyd and Doyle Floyd at this moment is like, he's scared. He's going to die. I think. Yeah. Doyle. I knew I gave him four threes. You had to make a switch. And Lonigan, just the explosion of rage out of him when he says, we can't let him get away with it. What was I supposed to do? Call him for teaching better than me in front of the others. So this level of anger yeah. and rage is what Johnny Hooker is about to walk into. Yeah. And at this moment, I think it's a good time to end part one of The Sting because a lot of stuff is going to happen. We've set all the pieces up. Yep. And now we're going to start knocking them down. Yeah. And as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts of The Sting. You can visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. It's Cine underscore Files on Twitter, Cinephiles Podcast on Instagram. And of course, you can subscribe to the show at all the usual paces on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. On YouTube, we love your comments. And on Spotify, it's been really great because on Spotify, which Apple doesn't let you do, Mm. you can comment on individual episodes. And we've seen your comments in some of the most recent episodes. They're super fun to get. Thank you so much for your comments there. You could support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where you can listen to our cinephile shorts, ad-free versions of the show, as well as joining our advisory board. And of course, the ad-free versions and the uh, shorts are also available on Apple Podcasts for a simple subscription fee. And you can buy or stream The Sting along with every other movie we've ever reviewed on cinephiles.net. And you can reach me at SR Morris on Twitter and SR Morris one on Instagram. John, how would people reach you? You can always reach me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca Says, and my other podcasts, The Hot Mic and The Geek Buddies. They're out there for you all to enjoy and listen to. And I think that's it for this week. And we'll be back next time to conclude our exploration of one of the greatest caper movies of all time, The Sting right here on The Cinephiles. <laughs>